the hula hula Till I'm good living in bone Till you go to your dome Go and see bambo, ziddle bambo Till you have to deal with the tip of the bone Ziddle have the bap a diddle foot Look up to your dome Till you have to live it up a diddle bambo Foot leap from go to your dome Hula hula Till I'm on for the dumbo Go to your dome, to your dome Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, that's enough, I think you've been prompted. I always feel a right prat when something like that happens, you strap. You come on dead smooth. Making Frank Sinatra look rough, you walk on, pick the guitar up, grin at the applause, and it all falls apart. <laughs> God. Well, good evening and welcome to Buxton. A small town in the Derbyshire Pennines, famous for being a small town in the Derbyshire Pennines. <laughs> I've had trouble getting here this afternoon for the elephants queuing up to come here and die. It's a wonderful place. <laughs> Wonderful place. When I was in Australia, who's tittering out the back there? Either laugh with the others or get out. Carbolis! Tittering, enjoying themselves. You're not here to enjoy yourself. It's a BBC programme. This sit quiet. Now, when I was in Australia, I want to tell you some things now because if you feel like going to Australia for the weekend, you know, you want to go for the weekend, you, you can go for the weekend. You can. Where does buses go from Matlock Bath? <laughs> I do. Well, it's about the only thing that goes from Matlock Bath. I... <laughs> Man, yeah, I used to know a girl from Matlock Bath that used to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Silly fool, stop it. <laughs> but no, if you do decide to go, I mean, I want to just explain some things. I used to do a whole routine once, I think it was on the telly one time, about... Um, American English, about how different it was, American English. Now, words like faggot had a different meaning in England to what they did in America. And the ver you know, to lose your cherry meant something entirely different in America, you know. Well, in Australia, they do have a lot of different words as well. So, I better explain them in case you do decide to go, because you can be, you know, very confused. I mean, we got off the plane. Dave, the roadie, and me was at the back doing all the sound mixing. Dave and I got off the plane, like... And we were met by this representative of the Australian Arts Council. You could tell he was from the Arts Council because he was falling over all the time, <laughs> wobbling about. You know. And he sort of came up with John Renfrew, a wonderful bloke, amazing character. I could tell you hours and hours of gags about him. With big beard on him, falling all over the place, big shirt, like big can of Foster's Lager. Like, you can... Ah, he says, hello, mates. Ah, bloody dink and blue. She'll be bloody right apples, she bloody will. Mate, bloody apples, she will. Bloody right, mate. Ah, she'll be bloody right, bloody dink and bloody singing, mate. Bloody get down and have a few beers for you. I can't go wrong, mate. Hey, bloody well, what? I said, well, I take milk and no sugar, actually. I said, I don't, I don't understand him. Is that a month? It took me a month to understand what they were saying. She says, it's worse than being in Birmingham. <laughs> you know. How can three million people have a speech impediment, eh? <laughs> well, there was it in Australia, like, and, and, and this lad, John, he said, uh, Well, mate, he said, the, the first thing you've got to do, he said, you've got to drive to the concerts, got to drive to the concerts, so we've got to hire a care for you. You've got to hire a care, right? And when you hire a care in Australia, you've got to make sure the care has got rhubarbs on it. I said, he's got what? So you've got to make sure the care's got rhubarbs on it. Now I found out later that rhubarbs are big, huge iron bars that they have on the front of the cars. So when they're going down these roads in the in the outback, you know, they can knock the kangaroos off the road. <laughs> Truthful, I kid you not. Because apparently, these kangaroos have a drink problem, you know. <laughs> and they get slopped up and wobble onto the road singing, Time me man down, sport. Time me man down. And they got these bars on to knock them out of the way, but I thought, he, I didn't think he said rhubarb. I thought he said rhubarb. <laughs> so I said, well, you got to have that on the front of your car for? He said, if you ain't got it on the front of the car, they fine you a hundred dollars a day. I said, for not having rhubarb on the front of my car? <laughs> he said, yeah, that's right, well, bloody apples it is, bloody apples, my bloody health, mate. So I thought, I better have some of that, and I went to the greengrocers, I bought 40 pounds worth of rhubarb. <laughs> I did. I tied this rhubarb all over the front. Me and Dave, we were up all morning lashing it on. 
Luckily, there was some iron bars on the front of the car, so I got something to tie it on, you know. I said, they must be rhubarb bars these days. They're very handy, aren't they? So I tied the rhubarb on the rhubarb bars, and we... We're, dri we're driving off through Darwin, and as we're driving along, people are taking their hats off, saying, take your hat off, it's an Italian funeral. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. And there's another expression. It's your shout over there means it's your round of drinks. It's your turn to buy the drinks. Well, I'm there in the bar having a few frosty like drinking away, glug, glug, glug. And this fellow comes up and says, How right, you little pommy bastard? He said, It's your shout. I said, What? He said, It's your shout. I said, Okay, right, okay. Carry packers a puff. <laughs> Bottles, chairs flying. All off. Another expression they've got over there, the verb to chunna. Now, to chunna round our way, round here as well, mostly in England, most of England, to chunna means to talk, you know. What are you chunnering about? Shut up, chunnering. Are you rabbit, 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 chunnering away? To chunna in Australia means to be sick. <laughs> to avoid the contents of one's stomach, yes? Or as the Australian expression goes, the big spit. <laughs> the liquid laugh. <laughs> sheer poetry, eh? Sheer poetry. Yes. Yodeling down the big white telephone. <laughs> Yodeling up your breakfast. Wonderful expressions. So I didn't know this. At this party with this bloke, he's giving me GBH of the year all about cricket and how bad we are at cricket. I know we're bad, you know. But he's giving me plenty tennis in the year. I can't get away from him. In the end, I said, I'm going in the next room where all the women are. Because women and men drink separately in Australia. They don't like to know that each other drinks, you know. So I said, I'm going in the other room with the girls. Like He said, what for? I said, well, I'm going to have a bit of a chunner. Like, you know, he said, ah, he said, I'll come with you. He goes in and said, Hello, girls, how's it going? Are you all right? <laughs> That's right, you get what's going on? You bomb pot, you head banger, go on. <laughs> Barmy. Another expression they've got over there, well, an expression we use over here, but it's got a totally different meaning. To root. Now, you know, around, you know, we, to root, it means, to, it's an old expression, for to look, like if you're going to look for something, you know, I'm just going to have a root in the back cupboard for my football boots, you know, I'm going to have a bit of a root. Or it might mean to root, to plant little seedlings, you know, to root. To root in Australia, it means dip your bread. That's what it means. Yes. Yes. Rumpo, rumpo, that's what it means. All that armchair wrestling in the Borgias, that's what it's all about. So I don't know this. Nobody tells me. They should give you a phrase, but when you go over there. I'm talking in this big place like in Adelaide and I'm telling this story about how when I was a kid in school in Manchester, you know, and so you mention Manchester or any town in England, you get all the poms going, Hey, Manchester! Hey! And all the others are saying, shut up, you pommy bastard. Boom. <laughs> so I was a kid in school in Manchester, I said, and this woman used to come round once a month from the health authority, like, you know, and she'd come round and she, you know, I said she was Nitty Nora, the bug explorer, we used to call her. <laughs> The knit nurse, I said, she'd come in our classroom looking for mechanical dandruff, right? <laughs> I said, and she'd line us all up, she'd line all the kids up, I said. She'd line all the lads up first, she said. And I said, she'd have a good route, you know. <laughs> I said, yeah, get all the lads lined up, have a good route, you know. I'm getting laughs where I've never had them before. They're rolling on the floor, they do the technicolor yawn all over the everything's going off, the balmy, they're going like they're beating the floor, kicking the legs in the air. I said, all right, she'd root in our school, then she'd go and have a route down the next school. I said, Spend all day going around town rooting, yes. Well, I came off at the end of the night, I felt about eight foot tall. I thought, magic, love Australia, gonna go and live here. I think it's brilliant. This fellow said, Did you know what you said then? <laughs> on nationwide television, did you know what you said then? <laughs> Apparently the phones were melting, like, you know, these... <laughs> farmers shooting themselves in the outback, you know. <laughs> End of civilization as we know it, you know. I said, what? I just said, Ruth, he said, shut up! I said, well, what is it? And he told me what it... I said, it doesn't mean... He said, does. I said, it doesn't mean... They said, yes. I said, you mean... He said, yes. I said, what? Oh. <laughs> Root me, I said. <laughs> I 
us. <laughs> That'll go. That'll go. Bet you a fiver. I said, <laughs> I said, you really mean it means dirt? I said, yeah, he said. I said, well, that must mean there's certain expressions you can't use in Australia, like rooted to the spot. <laughs> yeah. Or the AA have worked me a route out. <laughs> ah, that's great. Can you get her to work me one out too? <laughs> you know? And, uh, I mean, things like, what, arrowroot? Arrowroot? Must have been something Robin Hood had once, I don't know. <laughs> Beetroot? Must be something sadist due to masochists. <laughs> Ginger root? Fred Astaire must have been very happy about that one. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, you could make a fortune over there selling rooting powder, couldn't you? <laughs> Buy some rooting powder? I tried this here rooting powder. I just got twigs on the end of it. <laughs> got to have it pruned every month now. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, I'm not kidding. I wouldn't want you to go over there ignorant, not knowing this. I mean, and the wonderful, I mean, because it's a new country and because a lot of immigrant people have got wonderful expressions, I mean, certain expressions describing bodily functions are unbelievable, you know. I don't mean putting your hat on, I mean other bodily functions, you know what I mean? You know. I was in this place one night, and this fellow got up, and he meant he was going for a Jimmy Riddle, like, you know what I mean? You know, Gypsy's Kiss, and he stood up, he says, right. He said, well, mate, he said, I'm just going to siphon the python. <laughs> really? Brilliant. <laughs> Wonderful expressions. <laughs> Cosmic man. And I mean, there's another bloke going, he was going off and he, he was going for a number two, you know. You know. <laughs> a pony and trap. Like, knee stood up, he says, he said, well, well, mates, I'm just going to choke a dorky. <laughs> really? Really? I'm on the phone to the police. Quick, quick. There's a bloke here strangling Aborigines. Get over quick. <laughs> Another expression in the opera, I'm just going to see a brown friend off to the sea. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. I mean, the, the mix-ups, can you imagine the mix-ups you could have? I mean, another thing, I could hardly believe this. I could not believe this. I found this one really hard to believe. But the trade name for sellotape, the trade name for sellotape in Australia is Jorex. Did you know that? <laughs> Jorex. Can you imagine the confusion? <laughs> You're going to Woolworths, uh, can I have a Jorex, please? Some Jorex? Oh. <laughs> Do it yourself, job, eh? <laughs> have you got any knitting needles, sir? <laughs> I mean, really, truthfully. I'm in this bloke's house, smashing fella, down the bottom end of the country, Geraldton there, and I'm having Sunday dinner with him and his family, all the kids all sat round, been invited to the house, right, smashing, eating there, right, finishes his dinner, he stands up, he says, well, I'm just going to get some Jorex. <laughs> so I've got a fork stuck in the side of my head, I'm... <laughs> what? I said, do you want, to take, want me to take the kids out for a bit or anything like that? <laughs> He said, no, nah, I'm just going to tie some parcels up with it. I said, well, that's one way of smuggling them into Ireland, isn't it? <laughs> Don't cut a string, Sean. Your father wants it. Oh. <laughs> True. Well, they're amazing. I mean, the other thing, the other thing that was... Unbelievable. The last thing that actually happened to us, me and Dave, just as we were leaving Darwin on the last night of the tour, we're in this hotel. Now, they've got this bird in Australia, not a, not a, a, a flat, flat type bird, you know, feathers. And it's called the cormorant. You've probably heard of it. But the Australian name for a cormorant is a common shag, right? So we're in the hotel that night, checking out, 
And this woman came in, loads of suitcases, staggers up the steps of the hotel, drops the suitcases and stands there in the foyer. She said, ah, she said, I feel just like a shag on a rock. <laughs> really? What? Me and Dave are going all over the hotel looking for boulders. Anybody? <laughs> True, honest to God. But the favourite expression in Australia is she'll be right, mate. She'll be right. Which means everything's going to be okay, no worries. She'll be right. You know, they say this all the time. It doesn't matter what happens. They just say, ah, she'll be right, mate. You're lying there with your legs cut off by a tram, you know. <laughs> ah, she'll be right, mate. She'll be right. And so I wrote this song when I was in Australia called She'll Be Right. And there's a couple of things I'd probably better not explain. Um, King's Cross area of Sydney, which is mentioned in the song, the King's Cross area is a sort of the Soho or Manningham Lane, the red light area of Sydney. And um, what else is the Sydney? Darwin, Darwin's a bit hot and steamy and wet. It's in the sort of wet area, the tropical season. And they've got uh, poisonous things in Darwin, loads of things that can kill you or, or hurt you or make you frightened or make you at least wish you hadn't come, you know. I mean, really, really, they've got saltwater crocodiles. I mean, you think you're safe if you're not in a muddy river or you're swimming in the sea, you think there can't be any crocodiles here. Shoop, gone. <laughs> They're so evil, they've actually learnt to live in salt water, these crocodiles. And they've got spiders, they've got poisonous spiders. There's a spider called the funnel web spider. If that bites you, you're dead in three seconds. Three seconds a funnel web spider bites you. For years, they thought this spider was called a fur because people ran in and said, Help! I've just been bitten by a fur! <laughs> Another spider, wait till I tell you about this one. Another spider called a red-backed spider, right? Now, a red-backed spider, when it bites you, it doesn't kill you, but it, it hurts and you get a lot of pain and you get a tremendous swelling whenever it bites you, right? It all swells up, right? And the thing about the red-backed spider, this is true. If you ever read Clive James' book, which is his autobiography, Dead Funny, if you ever read it, the red-backed spider lives under dunny seats. The dunny is the outside toilet, right, in Australia, right? That's where the red buck spider lives, under the toilet seat, which I think is bloody unsporting. <laughs> <as it is. laughs> I think that's rotten. Because you could be there siphoning the pipe and boom, ah! <laughs> you wake up in hospital two days later going, oh, 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 oh. oh. <laughs> Can you take away the pain but leave the swelling? <laughs> it's an amazing place. Oh, yes. Another thing... <laughs> Shut up, Cartwright. Another thing... Another thing I want to tell you that I know will never grace the screens, but this is true, and it's in the song. The Australian slang word, they have this slang word, um, Norks. Norks is an Australian slang word for ladies' bazooms. What a horrible word for something as nice as bazooms. <laughs> Nox. <laughs> it's horrible, isn't it? Because I think, I mean, I'm a feminist. I really like, you know, I believe in women's limit and everything. And I really like, as a man, I really like bazooms. I think they're great. I think bazooms are smashing because they're all, you know, soft and warm and everything. I, ooh, I like them. <laughs> yep. Yep. In fact, if I had a pair myself, I'd never go out. I wouldn't bother. <laughs> But, um, oh, it's true. But, I mean, Nox. Nox sounds horrible. Nox. It sounds like something out of The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings, doesn't it? Quick, Bilbo, the Nox are after us. Okay. <laughs> Goblins? I don't know. You better ask them. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so, anyway, this song's got constant references to various things. It's called She'll Be Right, Mate. There is a chorus in it, but I do it all right on my own, so don't worry. When I went to Australia, they called me a bloody bum. Gave me ice cold beer, made me feel queer and turned me bed snake numb. And you had forgotten something. <laughs> bed snakes, right? Um, nobody's ever died from a bed snake bite yet. <laughs> Made a few people dizzy, but nobody's ever died. 
They said I was a good old bastard and called me their new chum. And they filled me with foaming frosties till I was fuller than a kookaburra's bum. <laughs> and they said, she'll be right, mate. Ah, oh, she'll be right, mate. Oh, my bloody oath, that stinking blue. It's your shout, I'll have a tube. Mind the flies and mind the crocs, the shakes and the spiders and the snakes. I'm going for a ground on the white telephone and she'll be all right, mate. They sent me up to Sydney. I got lost at King's Cross, where the women wear vests and not much else in the street of a thousand knocks. I'd had a lot of frosties and my back teeth were swimming. The Salvation Band said, what's well, save them, people? I said, well, save me a couple of women and she'll be right, mate. Ah, oh, she'll be right, mate. My bloody elf, that stinking blue, it's your shout, I'll have a tube. Mind the flies and mind the crocs, the shakes and the spiders and the snakes. I'm going for a groan on the white telephone and she'll be all right, mate. They sent me to Darwin in the wet, like living in a navvy's boot. The women were bigger than a ramrod digger, made Dracula look like a poof. Cockroaches the size of dogs and beer like ostrich beef. And the women shout, Morris, do you want me to sing your sausage as you walk down the street? <laughs> oh, she'll be right, mate. She'll be right, mate. My bloody oath, that's stinking blue. It's your shout, I'll have a tube. Mind the flies and mind the crocs, the shakes and the spiders and the snakes. I'm going for a ground on the white telephone and she'll be all right, mate. Adelaide. It's hard to describe Adelaide. It's quiet, quiet. For a bit of excitement in Adelaide, they go and watch the floorboards warping. <laughs> the local pub. Man, it's not as bad as Matlock, is it, eh? <laughs> For excitement in Matlock, they go and watch the bacon slicer at the co-op. <laughs> Man, she has got a lovely bum, that lass. <laughs> they sent me up to Adelaide, a sleepy little place, where bugger all happened, then nothing much, then bugger all happened again. <laughs> then it went quiet for a bit, and then just for a change, sod all happened, then nothing much, then bugger all happened again. <laughs> and they said, oh, she'll be right, mate. She'll be right, mate. My bloody old flesh stinking blue, it's your shout, I'll have a tube. Mind the flies and mind the crocs, the shakes and the spiders and the snakes. I'm going for a groan on the white telephone and she'll be all right, mate. They sent me to the desert where there's lots of bugger all. The sand gets in your darky box, your family jewels and all. <laughs> I was, I was hotter than a sinner's body in hell. And I thought I couldn't hack it any longer. I was happy as a bishop with a boil on his bum. I was redder than a dingo's donger. <laughs> and they said, she'll be right, mate. Ah, she'll be right, mate. My bloody oath, that's stinking blue, it's your shout, I'll have a tube. Mind the flies and mind the crocs, the shakes and the spiders and the snakes. I'm going for a groan on the white telephone and she'll be all right, mate. That's stinking blue. Thank you, buddy. Till you bump, till you don't. Go and see bumpo, see the bumpo. Silly at the deal, little zip and umbo, zip lava, the papa did all good, look up the old door. Silly at the deal, the little umbo. This is a song I'm going to find it hard to describe. It was written by a bloke called Dave Goulder, and Dave was at one time, I think he was from Derby originally, and he was a one time uh, footplate man on British Rail. And then he went to live up in Scotland and wrote a lot of songs while he was up there about the countryside and about living in the country from having been an industrial town lad. And this song's about the passing of the seasons and the changing of the seasons. It's a simple song. And it's one of those many songs that I've heard recently that I wish I'd written myself. And it's just called The January Man. The January man, he walks abroad in woolen coat 
hundreds of leathers. The February man, he brushes snow from off his head and blows his hands. The man of March looks through the spring and wonders what each year will bring. And he hopes for better weather. Through April rains, the man goes down to watch the birds come in to share the summer. The man of May stands very still, watching the children dance away the day while in june the man inside the man is young and wants to lend a hand and welcome each newcomer Then in July, the man in cotton shirt, he sits and dreams of being idle. The August man in thousands takes the road to find the sun and see the sea. But September man is standing near to settle up and lead the year and autumn is his bridal And the new October man, he takes the reins And early frost is on his shoulder The poor November man sees mist and rain And fire and frost and winter's cold While December man looks through the snow to let her love brothers know that they're all a little older. Then the January man comes round again in woolen coats and boots of leather. To take another turn to walk along the icy road he knows so well. All oh, the January man is here for starting each and every year along the road forever. Number 13 in the Interesting Characters of Britain series, a set of 9,043. Given three with Jen Singh D. <laughs> it don't work, I can tell you. <laughs> well, it only works 11 times. <laughs> Interesting Characters of Britain, the ladies' man. Now, 
you've seen these ladies' men. You might need your memory jogging a bit, but you've all seen these ladies' men. What well, they call the wine bar cowboys or the Butlin's buccaneers. You know, you're in the wine bar there and then they come. Marvellous characters, right? He's got the shirt open down to his waist here and this big, huge chest wig bristling out of it. Right? <laughs> He's got the gold ingot bar hanging on a piece of chain with expensive written on it, swinging around here. <laughs> you know, He's got rings all over his fingers, like four and a half ounces of gold on each hand, dragging along the floor. You know, he's got the, he's got the skin-tight trousers. You can't buy trousers like those. You've got to be born in them. <laughs> skin-tight trousers, they're hugging him. So from behind, it looks like two rabbits in a poacher's bag, you know. <laughs> and from the front, it looks as though he's going siphoning petrol on the way home. You know, it's <laughs> and he's... He's got the... He's got the hair, hair done back in a big John Revolting sort of style on a big day at the back, really handsome, like sort of new romantic. And he sort of comes in, like, comes in the wine bar and he's got the key ring, like, and he looks round, you know, and he's sort of got these brain cells in the back of his head, which are just magic. They can just find a girl on her own in a room full of people. He'll sort it out. It's like magnetic, sort of goes beep, 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 beep. And he goes over to this girl at the bar. And he's got this deep, romantic voice that he's learnt by playing 78 records, you know, 78 RPM, playing them at 45, you know. <laughs> and there's this girl on her own at the bar, and he goes up, and he leans right in, right up to her, drops his key rings on the counter, he leans right in and looks at her, fixes her with his stare, with his eyes, really seductive sort of eyes, you know, like cuts in liver. And he leans over, <laughs> and he looks at her, and he leans down and he says, Hi. What's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? I'm with me friend, Doreen. <laughs> but he's not put off because she's the only one there. She's the only single one. Gee, that's, that's great. You know, um, uh, where, where is Doreen? She's gone for a pee. She'll be back in a minute. Oh, gee, that's cool, you know, that's cool. Um, look at, you know, I mean, look at, you know, why don't, um, why don't I buy you a drink? Would you like a drink? Yeah, I'll have a drink. I'll have a pint of traffic lights. <laughs> a pint of traffic lights? You don't know what traffic lights are? It's liqueurs, green, yellow and gold liqueurs. And you get the green, yellow, gold, and then the red, and you get green, yellow and red. It's like traffic lights, and you get a pint, and, and I drink it. Oh, okay, sure, sure, you know. Really smooth. He's got about 15 quid in his back pocket. He's going to be skint in one round. <laughs> hey, Pedro, mi amigo. Hey, mi amigo. Hey, que pasa, eh? All this chat. Que pasa, eh? Same problem, eh? Hey, molto bene, molto bene. He went for 14 days to Ibiza and never forgot it. You know. <laughs> it's what Spanish kraut Italian garbage is talking. So up comes Raphael, who's actually from Rottenstall. <laughs> uh, what you want, pal? Um, can I have a pint of traffic lights for the lady, please? And, uh, he looks at his monkey, a glass of ice water for myself. <laughs> so he brings in this pint of traffic lights. This bird sinks it in one. He says, seven and a half pound, pal. He pays seven and a half quid, like, he leans in. He thinks, I've got to pretend, like, you know, I've got to really work this one. So he leans right in again. And it's the eyes, the husky voice, deep, romantic, suggestive, vibrant. He says, um, tell me, what do you do for a living? I work in dogs' home, killing dogs. <laughs> oh. That's really great. You must meet a lot of interesting dogs. <laughs> Look, you know, I mean, I came in this place tonight, you know, and I, I saw you, you know, and you saw me, and we looked at each other, and I saw you looking at me across the room, and you saw me looking at you, looking at me, looking at you across the room, and... You know what, just like um, you and I, you know, it's just like ships that pass in the night, you know, man. I mean, you know, when people meet each other like us, it's just like ships in the great ocean of tears, you know. And when two ships pass in the night, maybe the one ship should sail over to another ship, you know, or maybe these ships could get together. Are you a sailor? <laughs> no, it's just a sort of figure of speech. Look, 
Haven't we met somewhere before, you know, I mean, you know, was it Ibiza or San Marlo or San Monaco or, uh, you know, Bermuda or was it L.A.? You know, I mean, your face is really familiar. You know, maybe it was Benidorm, somewhere like that. No, we go to Cleefops every year, me and Dory. <laughs> Have a great time at Cleefops. We went last year, we caught crabs off the pier. <laughs> and he steps back a bit then, you know. And she's down this pint in one, and she puts it down, she says, uh, you're gonna buy me another pint of traffic lights, or what? He said, well, look. <laughs> he said, it'd make you drunk, wouldn't it? She said, who are you calling, wouldn't it, fat mouth? <laughs> and he's... <laughs> Let me explain. He... Are you listening? He, he, he's blown it. He's blown the gig completely, but he can't give up. Because this sort of guy can never stop. He's got to score all the time. And when I was a kid in Manchester, we had this fella live next door to us, who was exactly the same, but I was a kid of four. And my gran used to say, when he got up and went out, like every night, she'd say, there he goes, there he goes, all mouth and trousers. There he is again. <laughs> oh, he's a right ladies man, he is. He'd have a, he'd have a frog if it had stopped hopping. Look at this. <laughs> Eh? Oh! And I, I'm always fascinated by these characters, you know, and... So I've written this song, and it's about a ladies' man, but one of these ladies' men. And it's about a ladies' man who comes to a very sticky end. Not like that, no. It's a mucky lot. He was a ladies' man, wah wah, a real Don Juan, wah wah. Round all the dance halls and all of the discos, all of the bar rooms and all of the bistros, with wives and sweethearts, sisters and widows, and even the occasional gran. From nine to five, wah wah, to keep himself alive, wah wah. He worked in the co-op slicing bacon, sending the ladies home hearts aching, with nostrils flaring and pupils dilating at the way he packed their pork. There's nothing rude about that, don't laugh. About that. <laughs> with his brilliant creamed hair, moa suit, cigarette holder and brown suede shoes, like the fox that got into a chicken coop. He was a ladies' man. He was a Married man, wah wah, this deceitful Don Juan, wah wah. While his wife got ready for the Weight Watchers Club, he told her he was going playing darts down the pub, kept his Don Juan suit in a wooden tub, and got changed in the garden shed. Seven nights a week, wah wah, this sulphur chic, wah wah. Oiled his toupee and trimmed his tash. Pressed his suit till it looked dead flash And since he was going off out on the mash Made sure he got his packet of four With his real cream hair, one jump ahead More suit, cigarette holder and brown suede shoes Like the fox that got into the chicken coop He was a ladies man At the Tropicana, wah wah He met a lass called Anna, wah wah With his billiard chalk stuck behind his ear he fixed his face in a seductive leer, bought her a bag of scratchings, a half a beer, some crisps and a pickled egg. Smoothie. All through the night, wah wah, he held her tight, wah wah. Talked of love and her beautiful eyes, said they'd dance in the park neath the starry skies, and with breathy kisses and tender sighs, they went to get a donkey jacket. With his blue green hair, moe suits, Cigarette holder and brown suede shoes Like the fox that got into the chicken coop He once was a ladies' man In the corporation park Wah, wah Near the bull's foot in the dark Wah, wah He tickled her knees and squeezed her lips Moved along her arms to her fingertips And nibbled her thighs and squeezed her hips And reached for his packet of four He undid her dress Wah, wah Slid his eye inside her vest Wah, wah but what he found was a real shocker Cause instead of a soft, well, pair of knockers Was the hairy chest of a very gay docker Who'd shaved just an hour before <laughs> 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 Real green hair, 
Moet suit, cigarette hole for a brown sweet shoes, like the fox that got into the chicken coop. He was a ladies' man. He turned and ran. Wah wah, this confused man. Ra ra. But before he could reach the pitch and put, he was grabbed at the back of the park he's hut, and without benefit of clergy or anything but, became a man's man as well. <laughs> now, this a lady's man, wah wah, one time Don Juan, wah wah, stays in by the fireside every night, away from the dance halls and bright city lights, and strange ladies with hair curling out through their tights. And a bag case of barber's rush. No more grill creamed hair, no more mohair suit, no more cigarette holder, no more brown suede shoes. Like the fox that met a bulldog in the chicken's coop. He once was a ladies' man. Bodio. Yeah. Someone just rolled down my leg, I hope it's sweat. <laughs> <coughs> this is a... I'd like to do a, a quiet song for you now. And this is... Well, I think it's a very beautiful song. I didn't write it. It was written by a bloke called Ewan McCull, who came from Scotland when he was a young lad and lived in Salford most of his life. And some of you might know Ewan McCull as being the founder of Theatre Workshop with John Littlewood. And it was such wonderful productions as Oh, What a Lovely War, Taste of Honey and things like that. And Ewan was also a folk singer and a, a fine songwriter. And, and, and unfortunately, I think not a, a well enough known songwriter. Um, he written some beautiful songs like The Shoals of Herring and uh, this is another one of the beautiful songs. It's about Salford, in case anybody doesn't know what Salford is or where Salford is. Salford is a picturesque spa fishing village <laughs> just next to Manchester. And um, it's uh, been knocked about a lot like a lot of towns and smashed up and the planners have come in and redesigned it. Thanks very much, planners. And where do the planners live? Bloody Cheshire. <laughs> Mind you, the bloke who redesigned Salford apparently was savaged to death by his guide dog last month. <laughs> there's no, there's no, it's true. There's now a whacking great motorway, it goes right through it up towards Pendleton to join the sort of M62, you know, and link up with that anyway. And apparently, you know, uh, this happened a couple of months back, you know, it's murder to cross this thing. There's sort of eight lines of traffic all going past each other, flying past, you know, to oblivion. And a bloke's on one side of the street and he's trying to cross and he just couldn't manage it. And he saw a bloke on the other side, he said, How'd you get over there? He said, I was born here. <laughs> you know how we end up with all these new town developments, though? You know how we end up with all these? You know, before councillors can get elected, you know, into the town hall, they have to sign a written agreement to say that they'll have the brains taken out, you know. <laughs> And when they get there in the town hall, ready to inflict untold damage on our cities and the people, they get there in the town hall, and they all get around this table and they say, um, now us have been elected, <coughs> what shall us do? And one of the bright sparks at the bottom says, oh no, let's knock bloody town down. <laughs> and another 11 of them who just happen to be builders say, what a smart idea. <laughs> smart. And come and knock it down and redesign your lives entirely. Well, this song's about Salford as it was, and to an extent as it is. It's a simple song, I think a nice one and a beautiful song too. It's called Dirty Old Town. <laughs> I met my girl by the gasworks crawled 
And I dreamed a dream by the old canal And I kissed my love by the factory wall In a dirty old town In a dirty old town The clouds are drifting out across the night Cats are prowling out upon their beat Springs a girl on the streets at night A dirty old town, dirty old town I heard a siren sound from off the docks And I saw a train set the night on fire And I smelt the sea on a sulfur wind A dirty old town, dirty old town I'm gonna get me a good sharp axe Shining steel tempered in the fire I'm gonna chop you down like an old oak tree A dirty old town, dirty old town Met my girl by the gasworks cross Dreamed a dream by the old canal And I kissed my love by the factory wall A dirty old town, dirty old town a dirty old town In a dirty old town to be part of the same show this because all that crap lying over there alone. So. <laughs> I don't give a buggy you know I'm not bothered <laughs> cheers anyway <clears throat> if it's good enough for Dr. Jekyll it's good enough for me <laughs> I like this I like this Barry so the camera can't see it <laughs> Keep tight and we'll pretend it's a different show. <laughs> oh. Are you have a, a bad coffee? Get it up, it might be a piano. <laughs> Time now for a poem. I've had a lot of requests not to do this poem, but bugger it. <laughs> I'm reading it from the book because I get mental blocks in my head. <laughs> poem about, about a funeral, and uh, I'm not going to say very much about it because I think you're intelligent here and at home. So, uh, I'll leave, it's one of these deep, meaningful things. Um, I was going to do some of uh, Dylan Thomas's stuff tonight, but he never does none of mine, so... <laughs> Bugger him. <laughs> Ackroyd's funeral. 
A poem in words and erotic movements by me. <laughs> it was dark as a coal old picnic on the day Grandad Ackroyd dropped dead. Work was scarce as rocking horse droppings. <laughs> Not a church roof for miles with lead. So cold that the flame on the candle got frozen one Wednesday night and we had to warm it up in the oven before we could get it to light. <laughs> Some brass monkeys outside sung carol soprano. You could hear them cursing and swearing. As they wandered round lost in the cold and the frost, they couldn't find their bearings. <laughs> on Sunday, our chicken for dinner was a pigeon from off next door's loft. And my dad pumped it up with his bike pump too hard and our Sunday dinner buggered off. <laughs> what would you like to eat now, dad? Said our mum, picking her nose. <laughs> Hard boiled eggs, our dad said. You can't get your fingers in those. <laughs> we couldn't afford to kill the chicken. So we boiled some water up hot and with bunches of dried peas tied to its knees it paddled about on the top. <laughs> Me granddad had mortgaged his pension till 1994 while my gran in her vest was outside doing her best with a red light above cold shed door. <laughs> I can't stands no more, the old man cried. A mad light shone in his glass eye. We'll have to defraud the insurance man. Hands up, want to volunteer to die. <laughs> well, my mum said she would have, but she was too busy. Our Albert said his library book was due back. <laughs> Gran said she would, but her and her mates had got tickets for last Saturday's match. So we drew straws to settle the matter, but there was never no doubt because my dad cut my granddad's in half with bread knife just as he was pulling it out. <laughs> I'm too old to die, he said, using the cat as a club to belabor me, dad. All right, said dad, you don't have to die. Just lie down and pretend as you are. So my granddad lay down on the hearth rug and we called the doctor in. My grand took out a bottle and some glasses and got him smashed on a dandelion gin. He said, your granddad has died of a very rare disease. A bad case of tropical frostbite. <laughs> then he staggered off out and we all heard a shout from the street because he slipped in some dog shite. <laughs> Sorry about that. But there isn't a lot of rhymes with frostbite, you know what I mean? <laughs> Not that you can slip in anyway, you know. <laughs> Our Billy ran round for the man from the Prue. Gran filled him with dandelion gin. He paid four pound ten in used chip shop yen and said, when are you burying him? Oh, we weren't thinking of burying him, Grandma said. I was thinking of having him stuffed myself <laughs> or embalming him in that plastic raft and keeping him up mantel shell. <laughs> Nay, yon is illegal, said the man from the Prue. Your granddad will have to be buried in a box and shroud in constipated ground. <laughs> At this, Grandad looked a bit worried. <laughs> Man from the Prue said he'd come to the burying and see as how things was done quite right. Then he staggered off out and we all heard a shout from the street because he slipped on some more of that stuff, what I was telling you about. <laughs> I've just done that, said the doctor, so the insurance man rubbed his nose in it. <laughs> The pretend corpse now had to be buried. Me dad got an old kipper crate. When the holes we had plugged in the wood, it looked good. With plastic brass handles on, great. The only bit that rhymes hardly gets a bloody titter. Tummy. <laughs> we'll only bury you just till he's gone. Then we'll dig you up, honest, dad said. Took a bottle of gin before granddad give in and lay in the box to play dead. My gran looked in the box, saying, What a lovely corpse. <laughs> Tears fell on her dripping and toast. Till the body at rest shoved his hand up her vest, saying, Now then, how's that for a ghost? <laughs> so! <laughs> Shall 
Oh, yeah. So, so, we put the box on Big Mabel's coal cart. Enough to see Metri we set. We followed on bikes, and all went quite right, till another burying we met. A policeman was stood on point duty, because there was a fault in the traffic lights. But he fell to the ground with his arms flailing round, because he slipped in an overload of that stuff. <laughs> well, that's all that. We just did that, said the doctor, and the insurance man said the policeman. Well, As the copper hit the ground, the traffic flew round, and the two Berrians got in a jam. Their driver took a poke at me dad with a wrench and got a kick in the shoemakers off me mum. <laughs> when we sorted it out, we'd got the wrong box. Grandma said, "E, we won't see no more of him. When their driver come round, our Berrian we found had gone to the crematorium. <laughs> By the time that we got there, the service was done. You could hear the organ play as the congregation wet ankies and sniffed and our kipper box went on its way. <laughs> the shutters were open, we all heard the flames and suddenly my granddad gave a yell and a coffin with legs in its arse end on fire ran out on the conveyor belt. <laughs> Over the pews and out through the window, the burning kipper box ran. And we all cheered our crate as it swam through the lake, chased by me dad and me mum. <laughs> A blessed miracle, said me gran. But the man from the crew went quite white. Ruined he rode. He would have said more, but he slipped in the road and a little road of that stuff. <laughs> Well, we'll see if that gets out or not, won't we? Thank you. Hi enough, 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 enough. Night after night I've been coming out on here, walking out of that stupid hole in the wall, which we all know leads into a dirty street in Buxton. Walking out of there onto this stage and people clapping and people at home watching with the tea on the lap saying, yeah, better have been told to clap them, look. I'm fed up of coming out of there. I want, I'm, I'm coming on again, wait. That's it. Well, I don't believe this. I'm fascinated by archaeology, amongst other things. And I was reading in the uh, Barnsley Clarion Bugle and Observer this morning that uh, archaeologists digging in Tidsa, or Tideswell, as people outside the area would know it, archaeologists digging in Tidsa have actually unearthed the prehistoric remains of a hominid, a near human being. What is the, they think it's the missing link. They found this skull and, and bones and things, and they think it's the missing link that we've been looking for between the monkey and man for years. You know, I mean, you, you, you know they've been looking for this, trying to prove that we descended from Darwin. Maybe. <laughs> he had a bike. How do I know about this thing? <laughs> anyway. Him and Professor Huxley have been trying to prove for years and years that we're descended from the monkey, and they think they've actually found... Um, the missing link. Professor Leakey, who discovered Zinjanthropus bossi, and it took him a long time to get rid of it. <laughs> Purple ointment didn't do any good, he just tried everything. Shave his head in the end. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, he discovered... Now listen, or you'll go home ignorant. I keep telling you this. He discovered these fossilised remains. Now you've heard of Neolithic man and, and Paleolithic man and Mesolithic man. You know, well this new creature they've discovered is called Paralytic man. <laughs> Paralytic man used to spend a lot of his time, he was a nomadic creature, 
nomadic creature, he used to wander around in tribes, and he used to wander around worshipping uh, sacred groves and wells that were sacred to the great gods, Boddingtons, Tetleys, <laughs> Robinsons, you know, Theakstons, Breakspears, Ruddles, you know, even Youngs, and they, they even, they even worship false gods like Bass Charrington and things like that. You know. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, there was idolatry even in those days, you know, and, and they would go around to the sacred wells and paralytic man would come in in huge tribes and they would drink libations to the sacred god, you know, shouting things like, Sure, I'll next. <laughs> I don't know what this word meant, sure, I'll next. It meant something, but anyway. Gear hands in your pocket was another one. They used to shout, gear hands in your pocket. And they used to shout these sacred chants, and then they would drink until there was a sacred fall down ceremony, which took place <laughs> most evenings about 11 o'clock. <laughs> but while they were in these sacred temples dedicated to the worship of the gods, Boddington, Stetleys, etc., they used to also hunt, paralytic man used to hunt, a little creature called the log end. Now, the log end was a round wire-backed animal, round wire-backed animal with wire all over its back and it was made of cork and used to climb up the walls of these sacred edifices and you get about five foot four off the ground and they would have to hunt it and they would hunt it with three short throwing spears about this long, right? <laughs> and they used to, they used to kill... <laughs> well, that took some time, didn't it? <laughs> been drinking cement again, I know. And they, to, and they used to kill the log end by throwing these short throwing spears into its back, shouting hunting chants that helped the ritual of the hunt. Magical, like, uh, 100 on it, day, yeah. Or double top froth, or huge jammy bassa. <laughs> when they'd... When he'd kill the log end, when he finally killed the log end, and it had 501 lives, and they all had to be written off, these lives, you know. He killed the log end, he would go home on the tribal double-decker chariot to the council cave. And paralytic man would go home, full of libations, and he would go to the cave and try and mate with the female of the species. <laughs> now, it's always the women who giggle when you say that. I've never worked out one. And when he got home, he would try and mate with the female of the species. And this was usually totally unsuccessful because the mating was preceded by a ritual taking off the trousers, stumbling, falling down dance. <laughs> That's only seen now in the Iroquois Indians. And he would get his trousers around his ankles and fall over with his head against the radiator <laughs> and fall fast asleep. <laughs> and paralytic man, or homo non erectus, as he was known... <laughs> Is, is, thought to, is thought to have reproduced by binary fission, <laughs> like amoeba and telescopes do. And the only other thing they could find, and it's amazing, but you see, you learn when you come and see me. It's not like the other rubbish you get, you learn. The only other thing they've ever been able to find out about paralytic man is he hunted another animal. Now, brave enough as he was to stand there stabbing this thing in the back with his little spears, he fought a fierce, six-legged animal that used to live in these, these underground caverns with dingy lighting called the snooker. <laughs> and he used to go in and hunt the snooker armed with nothing but a short spear about this long and to kill the snooker, which was a big six-legged green-backed animal, to kill the snooker, he had to lean over it and knock its balls into its pockets with a long <laughs> Yes, I think I'll start by playing me nose. <laughs> a lot of people don't know that, hello, we got somebody woke up, have they? Are you all right? <laughs> don't sit there playing with yourself, get a manager. <laughs> Unexpected laugh, always check your flies. <laughs> but a dead bird never falls out of the nest, so that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. A lot of people don't know this, but you can't actually play your nose. Now, I don't know you people at home, don't know this, but, but most men, and I include myself in that description, vague as it may be, 
I've airs up the noses, and if you actually get hold of an air up your nose and actually sort of pull it down, you can do this. You just get hold of the air. No, don't do it yet. You get hold of the air. <laughs> and you pull it down, and if you trap it in your two front three feet, <laughs> you, you can play a tune on it. Honestly, listen. listen. Sun arise, go in the morning. Sun arise. You know, you can do it. Try it on your way home. <laughs> Just a bit of rubbish, thought it up, yeah. So, song now. How do I describe this song? Um, Saturday nights. Song's got nothing to do with Saturday nights, but I'll start off by the... Right. Every Saturday night, we used to go to a dance hall. Me and my mate, Pete Gittin, used to go to this dance hall called Chilton's in Cheetah Mill Road, which is where I learnt this next song. Now, Chilton's is very hard to describe. It used to go there. They, they now have a grab-a-granny night <laughs> uh, on a Wednesday, which is worth a look at. Um, but we used to go, and it was those days when, like, you know, you sort of got the big DA at the back and four pound of brilliantine, you know, all pulled back, you know, and you could have sort of sneering at yourself in the mirror, practising sneering, you know, because I, I used to think I looked handsome, you know. I used to think that without my glasses on, I used to look like Billy Fury, you know. <laughs> So I used to take my glasses off, put them in my pocket, and I used to go up to the mirror and just get this lift for here, and I used to stick a marble in my lip. <laughs> so I could get a proper sneer, and I'd go, uh-huh, like Billy Fury. And then I used to walk down the street bumping into lampposts. <laughs> and people used to say, is that Billy Fury choking on a marble in the road, as you know? <laughs> it's Mike Harder with no glasses on. <laughs> then you get to the dance hall, and like, you know, you'd press your suit under the bed. You know, you used to press your suit under the bed in them days. And uh, you get to the dance hall, and it was the days of the first fluorescent blue tubes, you know, those UVA tubes. Like, and you get in, and as soon as the tube went on, you'd see all the fluff on your jacket and your trousers. <laughs> <laughs> Italian suits dead smart with the three buttons up here and slit up here and the narrow lapels and the cardboard anky sticking out here and the matching tie from Woolies. And you're off there, you were king for the night, you know. Chip fat on the air and in there. The light goes on, you look like you come through a snowdrift on the way. <laughs> And the girls were great, the girls were great paper nylon underskirts on, eh? Hundreds of paper nylon underskirts, pound of sugar in the bath, trampling on them, <laughs> getting them out, then you put them on. <laughs> These paper nylon underskirts, it's a shame they don't have them now, because they were an early warning system, you know. Because <laughs> you'd be in the pictures in your dark, and you'd have a, one arm round here, trying to get it round the front, and <laughs> you might even cop a bit of strap, you know. <laughs> And then the right hand would go up, right? And all the static on the underskirts, there'd be blue flashes going off all of this. And... <laughs> Projectionist kicking the projector. It's gone off again, there's flashes out there. <laughs> it's all the hands, eh? Oh, and then bras, then bras with all the, all the circles stitched round them. And... <laughs> So it's then they go in, they go in like a dinner bowl, you know, they go... <laughs> oh. <laughs> and there were this stockings and suspenders, I've heard that they've come back now, people have started wearing them again. <laughs> no, them stockings, they were great, them was, them stockings and suspenders, the cool bit at the top. <laughs> And the thick bit at the top of the stocking, eh? The giggle band. The giggle band. <laughs> Get past that, you're laughing. <laughs> and there we all are, there's me, what, 17 years old, you know, lumps all everywhere and insecure, you know, trying to see if you've got bad breath. Do you remember that? You clean your teeth about 11 times. Still, you've got your hand over your mouth blowing up your nose. <laughs> And off you go dancing. Are you dancing? Are you asking? I'm asking. All right, I'm dancing. <laughs> and me and my mate Gitz used to go, now you don't know Pete Gitz, but I'll tell you, but handsome, good looking lad, always black hair, really good looking fella. Right from when he was little, you know, when he was little, he was good looking, you know. And there's me, like glasses, spots, ugly, everything. Just, you know, lurching behind him, like, you know. <laughs> now, we used to go to this dance hall. And the thing is about women, there's only a couple of things I've noticed about ladies, and uh, I've got to say, by the way, that I'm a feminist, and I, I, you know, I'm sort of all for women's rights and everything, but in those days, it was very sort of a male-dominated world, or so we thought, but women had us all around their little fingers, you know, all the handbags in the middle of the floor, all dancing together, you had to circle them like a pack of wolves and try and... 
<laughs> Try and pick one off, you know. Go on then, go on, go on, have a go. All right, have a go. Yeah. But the only thing I've noticed about girls, or noticed in those days in the dance hall, was that there's... Well, the first thing was, if one of them went for a wee, they all went. They never went to wee. <laughs> she'd get up there, she'd get her handbag over her arm and say, I'm going now, are you coming? <laughs> They'd all go off together, 12 of them. <laughs> for years it mystified me. Mystified me. Then I asked a mate of mine who was a plumber and he told me, the seats are very high, they've got to lift each other on and off in there. <laughs> Give us a shout when you want to leg down, won't you? But... And the other thing that fascinated me is that when you've got two women dancing together in a dance hall, you always had a nice one and a tug. <laughs> it did, it's true. Two women went out together in them days. I don't know if it's true nowadays, but there was always a nice one and a tug. Because the nice one knew she'd got no competition from the tug, and the tug thought she'd pick up what dropped off. <laughs> It's right. I went out with so many tugs they called me Queen Mary down there. <laughs> we get up, me and Gitz. Gitz gets the belter. He gets a cracker. Oh, she's gorgeous, right? He's dancing away with his Sophia Loren bird light. And there's me with all the fluff all over everything, shave round it, it, everything. Got the cardboard anky, the boot lace, the works. Get up there, I'm dancing with this thing. God help the lass. I mean, I'm dancing with it. You know, all it wanted was the valves. It was a boiler. You know what I mean? <laughs> she's so big, I'm actually stood on a steel toe cap wellies while she's taking me that. I thought there's no point in being subtle about this. Straight to the bar. I said, you drop them. She said, not usually, but you talk me into it. <laughs> and I took her home that night, you know. I had to pay double for her on the bus, you know. <laughs> two seats, she said, she's taken up two seats, she paid twice. So I paid for it twice. Hey, but the donkey jacket put me off a bit, like, you know, but... <laughs> At least she'd painted her wellies gold. I thought, you know, she's, she's got something there. She took me back to this place. I, I found it hard to describe, really. It was uh, Smedley Flats. They've knocked them down now to make way for another slum. But, <laughs> Smedley Flats used to linger. A little bit. Smedley Flats, which is called the Queen Elizabeth Flats collection. It was a big huge. It looked like a, a boat, you know. And um, we got off the bus, like, walked down Queen's Road to these flats now. We get there. And it's snowing, right? It starts snowing, middle of winter, like, you know, the old days you walk everywhere, you know, and bus everywhere. No cars or out like that. Get there, get to the foot of this place, like the Smedley Flats is all like dead dogs and prams and old bits outside it, you know. A bit like Bramall, really, you know. <laughs> and uh, we get there and she says, uh, you can come in for a coffee. <laughs> I thought, oh great, you're in here, Arden, you know. 17, all mouth and trousers, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, 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 here's me head, my bum's coming, you know. Straight in there in this flat, like, and everywhere there was a smell of boiling cabbage, ribs and cabbage, you know, got the ribs and cabbage boiling away, like, you know, no, I love ribs and cabbage, me, like, love it, to death, favourite food of all time, get in the kitchen there, right, she said, be quiet, my dad's in the front room, don't make a noise, my dad's in the front room, okay, fair enough, so we get in there, now, I've been reading this book, you know, you've heard of the perfume garden, haven't you, you know, right, and we've got this book, like, round our way called The Not Bad Allotment. <laughs> it's a sort of working-class version of the perfume garden. So I've been reading it, and it said the first thing to do if you want to get a woman going, like, is, like, blow in her ear. Apparently, I don't know. Don't try it here. You know, <laughs> a couple of hours to go yet. Pack it in. Blow in her ear. So I get stood on a chair, like, at the side. She's leaning up against the stove, like, you know. And we've got these big buckets full of coffee each, you know. And... She stood leaning against the stove, and I climbed on this chair, right? Now, picture this. I'm stood on the chair. She's eight foot two in her stocking feet, like... <laughs> stood. And I got right close into her head. And I thought, this is it, like, you know, like I've read on these books, like, you're supposed to sort of <laughs> blow in it. So it drives them bar me, apparently. So I got my mouth right up, and I went... <laughs> There's a big 
pink bubble coming out the other side of that. And she's just carrying on, you know. <laughs> Chewing gum, and I, I thought, this isn't work, like. I'm getting dizzy and holding on to the gas stop. <laughs> and number two was like, you start by tickling the back of the neck and then work your arm down the spine, like, you know, so I'm giving it all this, like, you know. <laughs> and I thought, go for the joker, don't mess about, you know. <laughs> so it, boom, and straight in the ribs and cabbage. Ah! the kitchen with eight fingers, I don't know which is mine, I'm... <laughs> a dad come in, he said, is she bothering you? Smash, right on her nose, boom. <laughs> I said, no, no, she just brought me over again. He said, get, you get, leave him alone. Get home while you're still in one piece, son. <laughs> She'd done this before, I have to bury him outside. Get, get up, on. <laughs> Go on, get to bed. And she goes off to bed, <laughs> I got thrown out. She said, go on, on your, on your bike, go on, on. I said, no, we're not. on your bike. He threw me out. I went down the stairs that night, I thought, I'm not having this. Thrown out. Not having it. One of the team, I am. One of the lads. Crumps will kamikaze a lot. <laughs> Can't be having all this. So I went off that night, and there. It had snowed all the time we were in the house, and it smoothed out all these milk crates and dead dogs and old bits and that. And this big, huge expanse of white, I thought, right. I'm going to whittle in the snow. <laughs> I'm going to write my name in the snow. <laughs> in whittle, and I did. <laughs> and I'm there, writing it. M-I-C-H, dot in the eyes, you know. <laughs> and, <laughs> always dot the eyes, teacher told me. And <laughs> I didn't know, but her dad was looking out the window and he says, Mother? Come on, look at this. She said, what? He showed this fella I've here has brought home. He's riddling the snow and written his name. She said, well, lads will be lads, you know what they like. He said, yeah, but this is Alvira's handwriting. It's all sloping back. <laughs> There was one sort of area we used to go when I was a kid, and it was a sort of meeting place for everybody, and there was an old gas lamp just about four doors down from me. And I wrote a song about it. It sounds a strange thing to do, write a song about a gas lamp, but honestly, we always used to meet there because there was like, there was two in the street, one right down the bottom and one at our top end. We lived next door to the corner shop. Big gas lamp, and all the kids used to meet there, and we used to play games, rally vol, kick can, black and white rabbit, tiggy off the ground, all the bits, you know, and we used to get... Uh, it had the, one, the old one with the arms out, you know, and you could climb up on it and light your fags off the mantle and things, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and then we used to tie swings on it and a rope and run round it and then kick your legs out and sort of go round and round until the string wound itself round the lamppost and you ended up with your head smashed in. <laughs> Good old games, you know. And uh, then they replaced it by one of these big concrete ones, you know. Now the thing is, they put this 48 foot concrete lamp post in our street, that's what you see on motorways, you know. Now the trouble is, our houses are only 18 foot high. <laughs> the street was pitch black, but we got the best lit roofs you've ever seen in Manchester. You know, the sparrows walking around with dark glasses on seeing too much of them. <laughs> too much of them. <laughs> so the whole thing went, and I suppose really in a way this is any intellectuals who happen to be watching tonight will recognise that this is what you would call a sentimental song. And well, I don't think there's anything wrong with sentiment in the right place. And um, it's a sentimental song in a way about the old kids and the gang and, and all the lot of us who used to meet. Down round this old gas lamp. And uh, if you're looking for any deep meaning in it, there isn't one. It's called The Old Green Iron Lamp. corner of a street there was an old gas lamp and those kids used to meet there every night we'd swing from its old bars and we'd play 
hide and seek in the shadows just beyond its yellow light and it must have seen some meetings and some changes through the years I know it's seen some laughter and I know it's seen some tears but time travels on and our old gang is gone met beneath that old green iron land All the kids from our street gang we meet each night Swap comics, tell a tale or fool around We talk about the things that we would be when we grew up The lights from that old lamp spilled on the ground And it must have seen some meetings and some changes through the years I know it's seen some laughter and I know it's seen some tears But time travels on and our old gang is gone met beneath that old green iron lamb I wonder where they are, the kids in our old gang Now that all the years have come between We've changed and we've all travelled now And that old green lamp is gone Nothing's gonna be the same again And it must have seen some meetings And some changes through the years I know it's seen some laughter And I know it's seen some tears But time travels on And our old gang is gone met beneath that old denying lamb If I could bring those old days back I wouldn't even try For the days when we knew sadness and knew pain I know I'd give a lot if I could bring back that old gang Meet them Underneath that lamp again And it must have seen some meetings And some changes through the years I know it's seen some laughter And I know it's seen some tears But time travels on And our old gang is gone Met beneath that old green iron lamp. Met beneath that old green iron lamp. <laughs> Goed zie van boos, zit lief van boos, zit liet en zit lucht, zit van een boos, zit laat het dan met die rood bloed, loop op die op toe. Zit liet en lief en dat ze kunnen dan boos. After we finished here tonight in this Mongolian Christmas cake. <laughs> me and the lads, when I say lads, when I say lads, I mean... I mean, the rough, the rough lads on the cameras, the, the, you know, the boiler suited workers, like, and the, you know, the, the great unwashed. When we finished here tonight, and the lighting techs and everything, and the, the roadies, my roadie Dave and Steve, uh, we're, we're going to a party afterwards, after the show, because uh, we get invited to loads of parties, like when we're touring around the country, and we, we, we're very careful what ones we go to now, because we used to go, years ago, we used to go to a lot of posh parties, you know, because you used to get people coming up to you, and they'd say things like, um, at the end of the show, you were just going home, right, and somebody come, big tall bloke, like the roly-poly outsider, come up and say, uh, 
Rather enjoy the show this evening. Rather enjoy the show. Super, super show, super show. Tell me, I'm, I'm, you know. Tell me. I, know he's, I, I suppose you do this full time, do you? Do this full time? <laughs> you know? Although, do, do, do you do this? Is this a proper job? You know, is it a proper job? Or do you have another real job? You have a real job. I said, oh, I've got, I got a real job. Yes, I've got a real job. I'm a test pilot for Draft Guinness. <laughs> yeah, no, oh, super, good, yes. Oh, uh, trivet, 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 trivet. Mm. Oh, trivet, trivet. Hmm. Anyway, well, what it is, old chap, what it is, really, um, we're having a bit of a, bit of a knees up. What? Hmm, hmm, huh? <laughs> bit of a, bit of a knees up, bit of a, bit of an old, you know, shindit, shindit, hmm. I'm um, uh, back at the old, you know, the old place, right, so if you could have uh, a funny way to bring in, you know, coming along. And, uh, we'd uh, love to have you there, and some people, you know, have a bit of a, you know, sort of drinky poos, and, um, you know, a bit of a wad, and, uh, cup of Rosie Lee, and whatever else you like, you know, and sort of, you know, just chat and meet people generally, relax, you know, have a good time. Russell, thank you very much. And uh, he said you could even bring the rough chaps, you know, them scruffy lads who come round with you. So I said, well, well, thank you very much. Like, so we go. I mean, we used to go. We don't go anymore. But what a mistake. I mean, what a mistake. So you go to places, really posh places, I'm talking about, like Glossop, you know, posh places like that. <laughs> there it is, Glossop, no. No. Glossop's posh. Just... Yeah. Just... So we, we go off to places like Glossop or Bram or, you know. And we go along, <laughs> Bramall's posh, cause it's posh. They get out of the bathroom, a pee in Bramall, they must be posh. <laughs> they do, they don't stand up and aim it, they get out, don't they get out. <laughs> so we'd get invited and we'd go, back. and you knew, it, you knew it was a mistake, let me explain. You'd know it was a mistake right away, because you'd get to this area that the address was on, you know, and they sort of drew a bit of a map. And you knew it was wrong because there were more trees than people. <laughs> you never seen houses like it. Like, you know, they, they, they used to look like institutes or homes. I couldn't believe that people lived in them. All them bedrooms, what do they do? They must sleep in a different one every day of the year. <laughs> Huge, I thought they were orphanages. You know, you can't imagine houses this size. And you go up this long path, like, and get to the door. And you'd press the bell. And from miles away inside the house, this thing would go, ding, dong. And then there'd be a bit of shuffling and chains would go and the door would open. And the hostess, who you'd not met yet, would be there. Stood there. And she's got the evening gown on, cut down to here, the bingo dress, eyes down, look in, you know, and you're there. <laughs> and she's run the last hundred yards to the door, so it's poking out a bit, and you stood there saying, uh, if you're selling them pups, I'll have the one with the pink nose. <laughs> you know, no. And all they... All they used to do, they used to just say, oh, how quaint. You can't upset them, you can't upset these upper crust. Oh, do you try it? No, they just say, oh, how quaint. Do come in. Are you, are you you're Michael, are you? You're Michael. Very pleased to meet you, Michael. Do come in. Do come in, and you go in and sink into the carpet. You're struggling like this, like, you know. And, and the roadies are not used to it. They're trying to steal bits and take it home. <laughs> you shake hands, she said, do come in. Meet lots and lots of interesting people. Lots and lots. You're going to have a really super time. Leave your coats there, you know, and you hang your coats up. And like, we've got like really rough jackets and that, and the, and the sort of, the jackets themselves are pinching things out of other people's pockets. They just... <laughs> and they open this double door, and inside this room, there's 200 people. And all I can describe them is, drink, let me put my guitar up, drinking ducks. Do you know what I mean? Have you seen these things you can buy from joke shops? The bird that dips in the cup of water and then goes out again like that, right? Because the people, they've got a paper plate in one hand with food all over it and a glass in the other, so they can't shake hands or wave at anybody. They're all going, hello, Jeremy, how are you? Yes, how are you? Wonderful to see you. The whole room. Hello, hello, how are you? Yeah. They're all giving it that. And you walk in, right, and you think, oh, no. <laughs> And you walk straight, she said, do come and meet, the, you, you'll meet some nice people here, do come in, Michael, the rough boys, you look after yourselves. And she drags me over, like, towards the drink. I used to drink a lot, like, you know, just to forget. Occasionally I couldn't remember what I was trying to forget, you know. But <laughs> so we go over there, she say, um, would you like a drink? Yeah, I'll have a bottle of brandy, please. <laughs> oh, how quaint. Um, <laughs> anything in it? Yeah, I'll have another bottle of brandy. <laughs> So she goes, two bottles of brandy, and there's no glass big enough, so you get the goldfish bowl, tip the goldfish in the trifle, all the brandy in it is stood there, ready for anything, right, this is it. Right, drinking away, and up comes King and Queen Nightmare. Roggers and Juju. 
The oh. hostess comes along and says, Roggers, Juju, do come on and meet Mick. This is Mick Mick. Where did he get these names from? Roggers, Juju, Mick Mick. I said, hello, pleased to meet you. How are you? All right. Yes, all right, right. Jobs are good. Hey, plenty of scran, you know what I mean? Plenty of grub. <laughs> eh? Plenty of booze. Be all right here, kid, won't we, eh? Yes, rather. Super, yes. I'm drinking with this fellow. I've never seen anything like it. Man. All he can talk about is cars. He's talking about his car. There's only two things I know about cars. Nothing and bugger all. <laughs> when I'm drinking, I'm saying, goodbye, brain cells, I must leave you. <laughs> He's saying, uh, I've got 1948 twin-eyed, frog-eyed, sprite, twin overhead cams and 45 PQ1 aerial sift, and they've got uh, twin overhead sumps and camshaft deliberators, and, and I can't understand a word he's saying. He's saying chain drive intermission, fault scanning, and, they, you know, he's going on and on. He said, but trouble is, took Juju out for a ride the other morning, you know, took Juju out, and then he starts talking about the car, and I don't know whether he's talking about the car or his missus. I'm lost, because I've had a bit of this, haven't I, you know. And, <laughs> He said, took, took her out for a ride the other morning, he took the old dear out, he said, and I've had a lot of trouble getting her started, you know, on these cold mornings. He said, I've tried everything, you know, tickling up the points, he said. <laughs> anyway, a friend of mine told me, he said, the points may be a bit rusty, so I got some surgical spirits, a couple of cotton buds, gave it that, he said, slip one in the box, and away we went. <laughs> I mean, do it night, bro, so I'm really walloping it down then. And I thought, I don't want to get too drunk too quick, like, you see. So I thought the best thing to do is eat. Now the one thing you must... Have you ever get invited to these posh parties? Have you ever... Don't eat. The one thing you must... Don't eat. They're used to it. They're used to it. All these people have got Claridge's and Arad's and they're used to all that and Sainsbury's. I'm not used to all this rich stuff. <laughs> They've moved in up here, haven't they? <laughs> We're going to send the UCP down there, don't worry. <laughs> Wait till they get some of that tripe, eh? Dress down there. They wonder what's it. And they'll be wearing it on the feet. They wonder what it's for. <laughs> but we're there on this posh party and the food. The table's groaning with it. They've got everything there. You can't eat the food that they've got there, though. It's not for us. They've got ball bearings on toast. <laughs> Hundreds of tiny little black ball bearings on toast. There's some kid on roller skates going... Mm, mm. I'm not eating them. They're my own teeth. These, I don't want to ruin them. And they've got these things, what, the anchovies, and, and, they look, neck end of sardine. <laughs> Somebody's got a kipper, a kipper, and a pencil sharpener, and giving it that. <laughs> you, you've not got a good mouthful in them, you've got to get a big bag of them, and that's it. And they've got these things, volivants, you can't eat, they look like you're just eating them, you can't eat them. <laughs> no thanks, I'm all right, I'll leave them out. And cheese, they've got cheese there. You can't eat that stuff, it's like people's feet. <laughs> I mean, it's growling on the table, it's lurking there going... <laughs> Somebody cuts it open, six people go... <laughs> I'm stood next to this woman, somebody cut her cheese open, I didn't know what it was, I'm going... She's very posh, black, and the pearls and every bombazine and all the bit, and the big up bouffant hair, I'm stood there, eating a sarni like, you know, lettuce and celery, and I'm just eating it, and... <laughs> looked at her, and... I said, have you just dropped one or what? <laughs> she, she said, no, I'll, I said, it's not me, somebody around here. <laughs> you can't eat stuff like that. So I'm eating a bit and drinking a bit, and then I, I, I think I must have had a bit too much, because you know you get that feeling when you're stood there, and all of a sudden the room starts moving on its own. <laughs> it's going up and down, you know. And, and the, you, know the, you know the green Korean lady over the mantelpiece? She's winking at you, you know, and... <laughs> Jig jigger Johnny, eh? <laughs> and the three plaster ducks on the wall have all flown up each other's jacks. Again. <laughs> and you stood there thinking, I'll be all right, I'll be all right, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Oh, it's just hiccups, it's just hiccups. I'm gonna be okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Please God, I'm all right, I'm all right. No, I'm not gonna be sick, I'm all right. Oh, yes, oh. Oh, yes, all right, yes, I'm not, I'm all right, I'm going to be sick. I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not, what, 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 excuse me. And this big head comes out of the sky, big head comes out of this cloud and goes, are you all right? <laughs> and you look at me, you go, yes. Yeah, could you tell me where the little boy's room is, please? I beg your pardon, the little boy's room, you queer or something, what's the matter with you? 
<laughs> no, no, I mean, you know, I, I want to it's usually, I'll just can I have a bath, please. Where's the bathroom? <laughs> I'd like a bath. Tell me where the bathroom is. Up the stairs, you cuckoo. So you run straight, boom, hit the bottom stair. As soon as you hit the bottom stair, all the stair rods fly up in the air. Wham! You've got to crash the run to go up, all in carpet like that. And you're trying to climb up this. You, you get up three, roll back again, up three, roll back in. You finally make the landing, collapse, balumph, on the deck, lying there with your nose an eighth of an inch from the carpet. And you're staring at this pile, and you're going, Hello, carpet. <laughs> oh, what a lovely carpet. You are, carpet. You're nice and friendly. It's warm here, carpet. I'm going to. I'm going to stay here forever and ever, Carpet. I love you, because you're not like them stupid people on stairs. You're lovely. I love you, Carpet. I can never love you. I'm going to stay here forever. And ever and ever. And... No, I'm not. Excuse me, Carpet. What? <laughs> and you kick open the bathroom door, and there's an old lady sat there with the trolleys around her ankles going, Ah! <laughs> and she says, Excuse me. I'm sorry. The house is on fire. Quick out. She runs downstairs with the knickers around her ankles. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> people drink. I say, is that your mother? No. <laughs> You run in, lock the door, and it all goes off. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Every village in Wales. Clangary, go, 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 go! Aberystwyth, Clangary, go, go, go! Oh, oh, and then you start yodeling. Yodel, 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 yodel! <laughs> oh, please, God, don't make me yodel anymore. Yodel, yodel, yodel! Oh, God, don't yodel, 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 yodel! Oh, God, I'll go to church every Sunday. Yodel, yodel, yodel! Oh, that was fun the first time. Don't make me yodel, yodel, yodel! Oh. Oh, and you look down, and there's always carrots. <laughs> always. always. So, I was the first to point this out eight years ago. Always. You may never have eaten carrots in your life, but there they are. You may have lived in an island devoid of carrots. Where did they come from? I think they live down the plug hole. And as soon as they hear you being sick, they say, come on, first somebody being sick up here, get me show you. Get me. But it doesn't matter where they come from, once they're there, they won't go down. <laughs> they will not. You've got the taps on, you're giving it... Oh. <laughs> oh. oh. And then you fall asleep for a bit with your head in the sink. Oh. <laughs> then you wake up again, I'm all right. Oh, I'm all right. I just have a drink of aftershave. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm all right, huh? I'm all right now. I'm okay. I'll be okay. So you eat a cotton bud. I'm all right now. I'm okay. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. Okay. I'm, I'm all right now. I'm all right. And this knitted poodle full of toilet rolls on the end of the window says, No, you're not. Yeah, I am. Yeah. No, you're not. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm all right. And everything's laughing at you. The walls are laughing. You get to the door, you just get your hand on the door, and it's the one you forgot about. The one deep down inside the recesses of you. The big one, the big... Sp you run back. Crack it to her! <laughs> oh. What are them underpants doing in the sink? <laughs> just a minute, they're mine. What? Oh. And you stagger downstairs to the party, and it's like they're, all they're still there. Hello, Jeremy, how are you? <laughs> and you walk, you're a foot off the ground. You're walking, floating. There's people saying... Who's that grey-looking chap with hot and cold tattooed on his forehead over there? <laughs> and you float through, out into the garden. And you think, oh, a bit of fresh air, be all right, a bit of fresh air. And you're not in the fresh air, you go... <gasps> <gasps> and the fellow comes out, he says, I see the daffodils are coming up, not them as well, I've just had... <laughs> carrots, I've had, not daffodils. I've had carrots, I've had, no, daffodils. And he leans over, and it's the original one, the touching the points up, Johnny, isn't it? And he leans down, and he says, uh, I, I, I met you before inside, didn't I? I smuggled over, yes. Tell me, what was your name? I didn't catch it. Smagadim. <laughs> I beg your pardon? Smagadim. <laughs> Smagadim? <laughs> is this a, is it Urdu or something? Is it Smagadim? I've never heard a name like this. Smagadim? <laughs> no! Smagal! Adam! <laughs> Smigel, oh, well, hello, Smigel. <laughs> What's your saying, him? Harding. Harding. Oh, uh, I knew some Hardings once. I knew some Hardings. Don't Kent. Uh, you know, you're not one of the Sidcup Hardings, are you? No, I'm one of the Pistol Hardings, me. <laughs> Lumber 
leven in bon, zullen je wat je doen. Goed, dat zie van po, zie je die van po, zie je het niet leuk. A few months back, I was sent to Australia. Uh, I was, oh really, I really was. <laughs> sent to Australia on uh, what the British Arts Council called a revenge tour. <laughs> They're getting their own back for Frank Highfield and Rolf Harris coming over here. <laughs> and I said, but you know, I, I can't paint or yodel. They said, now they can them buggers, get over there, go on. <laughs> And I must say, I enjoyed it, you know, walking upside down for a month with all these people. It was, it was, it was really good. They were smashing people, the Australians. But what nobody ever told me, and somebody should have told me, is that the worst thing you can ever do in Australia is remind the Australians that the first people to go over there were convicts. They don't like to be reminded about that, because apart from the Aborigines, the first punters we sent out there were out of the, you know, the shovel and nick. They were convicts, you know. And, uh, of course, Nobody tells Ardin, so Ardin, big mouth, stupid, thinks he's being topical and to the point, you know, wobbles straight on. Hello, Australia! 2,000 people in Perth, you know, hello, Australia! It's great to be here in what used to be Britain's biggest open air nick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, not a titter, nothing. <laughs> Just the sound of bottles being broken on chair legs. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't feel like clapping, just rattle your ball and chain. <laughs> oh, no, nothing. Just yellow breath coming towards me from the waves of apathy, hatred. And the trouble is with a comedian when he starts to die, when the gags don't go, he immediately panics because he's used to it. He gets, you know, he's got standard opening lines that he tries out, you know, and if they work, great, keeps him in. And if they don't work, he starts to panic. And the little brain cells at the back is like a control module up there, and they're all going, dive, 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 dive. <laughs> he's dying, get in the shot locker, get some of the old gags out, fling him. Oh, that's gone off and all. Oh, he's dying, get him off stage, he won't move, he's frozen. Oh, so the brain's going, scramble, scramble, scramble. I thought, I'll try one more, this has got to get him, this is going to make him laugh, I said. You know, I said, it's funny, it's cost me 650 pounds to get here. I said, and yet my great, 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 great grandfather got here for two loaves of bread. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> that night I was to entertainment what Cyril Smith is to hang gliding. <laughs> it was the only time I ever died because I dropped them gags and it went great after that. Every time I did it, it went great after that. But in the hotel that night, I stayed in this, this motel, you know, and, um, Lying there feeling really miserable, you can imagine 12,000 miles from home, upside down, hanging onto the ceiling like this, <laughs> frightened of falling off, you know. And I thought, oh, blimey. And I turned the radio on, and it was the World Service. You know, you know, I don't know how comforting. This is BBC, London, the World Service. I thought, home, contact with home. And then Victor Sylvester came on, you know, da 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 da. And now for Mrs. B.J. Johnson in Kuala Lumpur, and Mrs. Eric Snodgrass in Outer Mongolia. We have, and they do, they play that. I can just imagine these people in these bungalows in Kuala Lumpur all dancing around in time for the music. They do, you know, they do. Anyway, well, they did. But there I'm listening, and we got the news. And it was all about Parliament today, and it was so comforting to find that things were still the same back home, you know. It really was that our glorious Oberfuhrer Lieutenant Margaret was still there, you know. <laughs> Wonderful to find out she was still running the country, you know. Because, I mean, a lot of people think I don't like Margaret Thatcher, you know, this is not true, not true. I give her a lot of advice, Margaret, I give her a lot of advice, yeah. She doesn't take it, I'm afraid, most of it, you know. You know, because most of it's connected with sex and travel, you know. <laughs> I want to do now, if I can, for you, the song that went down like a brick budgie that first <laughs> night in Australia. This is one they hated. Um, it's a chorus song, and I, I know all night you've been sitting here waiting for the show to start, thinking, I do hope he sings some chorus songs tonight. I know you're sitting there thinking, give us a chorus song, mate. Let us sing. We want to show our tonsils off and give it plenty of rock in this place, you know. Wonderful. It's like the iron... It, it's like a Chinese bomb shelter, isn't it? Have you seen it? <laughs> well, it's... So I'm going to do a chorus song, and I'm going to start off... Get it up, love. She can be terrible chest, you know. <laughs> Cough it up. It might be a piano. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> and so... No, I want to do a chorus song. Are you listening? Or you'll go home ignorant and stupid. Now, listen. 
I'm going to do the chorus song, and I'm going to start off with the chorus first to give you a fighting chance, because it's no use me starting the song without having taught you the chorus, and then get to the chorus and say, I'll sing, and you all sit there going, <laughs> miming, you know. And there's other people, I know there's people there sitting thinking, we pay to hear you sing, not sing our bloody selves. <laughs> but yeah, give it a go, have a go at it, anyway. So I'll start off and do the chorus first, right. Watch the fingers here. Wonderful stuff, this. This isn't the chorus, by the way, this is an instrumental introduction. <laughs> chorus! Siddle yappy diddle every diddle and boat, fiddle your boat to your do, hula hula, siddle and fiddle every diddle boat, siddle your boat to your do, go and see bumpo, siddle di bumpo, siddle yappy diddle, see if I don't go, siddle have a dump, bappy diddle, good love out to your do. That's the ladies' part, okay? <laughs> Take your fingers off it, leave it alone, you know it don't belong to you. I said, take your fingers off it, leave it alone, you know it don't belong to you. There's two old ladies sitting in the sand, each one wishing that the other was a man. Take your fingers off it, leave it alone, you know it don't belong to you. I said, take your fingers off it, leave it alone, you know it don't belong to you. I said, take your fingers off it, leave it alone, you know it don't belong to you. Oh, ashes to ashes, dust to dust If the booze doesn't get me the smarties must Take your fingers off it, leave it alone You know it don't belong to you, I said Take your fingers off it, leave it alone You know it don't belong to you Take your fingers off it, leave it alone You know it don't belong to you There's just one thing I don't understand Why a bow-legged woman loves a knock-kneed man Take your fingers off it, leave it alone You know it don't belong to you All together Tiddly had to leave it up the diddle on both boats Leap from Cody Oto Ulula Tiddly had to leave it up the diddle on both Cody Oto Cody Oto Utskilly had to leave it up the diddle on both boats See my map the diddle on both boats See my map the diddle on both boats See my map the diddle on both boats Ulula Where was ya? Oh, blimey. Three singing, the rest miming like buggery. Go on. Seem more life in a dog's pelt. I'm drinking cement or something. Take your fingers off it, leave it alone. You know it don't belong to you. I said, take your fingers off it and leave it alone. You know it doesn't belong to you. Well, I went to the doctors, he said cough. He got cold hands, I said, Oh, take your fingers off it! Leave it alone! You don't want to! All together! Take your fingers off it, leave it alone! You know it don't belong to you! Take your fingers off it, leave it alone! You know it don't belong to you! Well, I know a girl, her name is Nellie. She can do it while she's watching the telly. Take your fingers off it, leave it alone! You know it don't belong to you! And I know a girl, her name is Annie. She stays up all night tickling her granny. Take your fingers off it, leave it alone! You know it don't belong to you. I said, "Diddle yap, diddle 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 yap." And that's jazz. Come here. Dead smooth, this show, isn't it? <laughs> I want to do a song now that uh, I learned sort of when I was in Barnsley, but I want to tell you a bit about it first, because we were in Barnsley on the tour last year, and we were drinking in this smashing pub in Barnsley called The George. Great pub, in there, giving it plenty of elbow bending. And in came a nightmare, right? <laughs> now, these are nightmares that you have during the day, you know, and you can't get rid of them, you know what I mean? So the young sort of bloke who knows everything, he's the pub know-all, he comes in, grabs hold of you, giving it GBH of the year all, rabbit, 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 and you're stuck with him. He's got the hook into your sleeve, you cannot get rid. He's there saying, did you know, did you know something? I bet you didn't know this, I'll tell you something now, you didn't know. There's enough sulphur in the human body to make a box of matches, did you know that? <laughs> yeah. Is there anything to strike him on? No, most, <laughs> that's, no. So this bloke's going on about the longest rivers in the world all the bit, rabbit, 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 rabbit. In the end, I got fed up. I said, do you like a drink, pal? He said, aye, aye. He said, I'll have a... Oh, I don't mind. I'll have a pint of draft Guinness. I said, right. I said, uh, pint of draft Guinness, landlord, please. And I lent in. I said, uh, 
put some syrup of figs and prunes in it. <laughs> and I said, what? I said, put some syrup of figs and prunes in it. So the landlord goes in the back, puts syrup of figs, prunes, and half a pint of draft Guinness, fills the pint pot up, gives it this bloke. This bloke doesn't even notice. He just thinks it's lumpy Guinness. He's drinking it. <laughs> Chewing it! <laughs> Aye, it's a bloody good pint of Guinness, this is. <laughs> eh? Plenty of body in this, what? Eh? This is the way it should be, you know, this is the way it should be all over this, right? Mm. And then he finds the stones, he starts taking them out. Eh? Guinness pips, look at that! <laughs> eh? I'm gonna take these home and plant them, I'm gonna have Guinness trees in the backyard, me, yeah. <laughs> He drunk 11 pints of syrup of figs, prunes, and Guinness, right? I don't know if you know this, but Guinness is bad enough on its own. You know. <laughs> but with syrup of figs and prunes, it's liquid Pickfords, it'll move anything. <laughs> he stood at the bus stop that night waiting for his bus. Stood there after about five minutes, he thought his brains had melted. <laughs> he stood there. He doesn't move. He doesn't hiccup, sneeze, wink, anything. <laughs> and the bus comes up. The bus guard's leaning on the back. He said, uh, are you getting on or what? He said, yes, yes. no. <laughs> I'll get the next one. He said, this is the last one, this pal. He said, the last one. He said, yeah. he said well, I'll walk. And he's shuffling down the road and it's useless. So he gets in this right posh area of Barnsley called Cuddeth like and he throws himself backwards over this low garden wall like. Climbs through all these rhododendron bushes and finds himself in the middle of a lawn in the moonlight. This is a true story now. He's in the middle of the lawn in the moonlight. He looks around, there's nobody around. He thinks, well, a man's got to do what a man's got to do, right? Drops the strides and the trolleys, right? That's as a pony, right? As a pony and trap, right? Serious? No, listen, listen. He gets up, looks round in the moonlight. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. No George the Thirds, nothing. He's thinking, just a minute. I can't be going radio rental. He's thinking, I can't be going. I definitely had a pony. Then there's no Georges. What's the game? And he's struck matches. He's looking, he's struck matches. He went home that night, he went home. <laughs> Shut up, Cartwright, he went home that night. He couldn't sleep, he couldn't rest. He was lying there and his wife said, what's that? He said, I can't, I can't rest. He's up early the next morning on the kid's bike, he pedals down to the same house. Just work out, can't work out, no George's, what's happened? So he looks over the wall, jumps over, there's nobody around, he's on his hands and knees looking on the lawn. <laughs> nothing, nothing. He finds a pair of shoes and there's feet in them and legs. He looks up, there's a bloke looking down saying, hey, what are you doing in here, you pal? What's the game? He said, well, I'm sorry, he said, I, I should have asked, he said, but my little lad kicked his ball over here while we were waiting for the bus light. He said, well, I didn't want to wake you up with it being Sunday morning. He said, I'm just looking for his ball. The fellow said, oh, I said, it's all right, carry on. He said, honey, he said, yeah, there's some funny things going on around here, you know. <laughs> he said, you won't believe what happened around here last night. He said, you will not believe. The wife's nerves are shot. She's had to go to her mother. She can't stand it. He said, do you know what happened last night? Somebody crapped on the tortoise. <laughs> He said, it came in the house like a Viking's helmet, he said. <laughs> yeah. It's a shame the people at home are going to miss that one, isn't it? <laughs> In case you've never seen one of these before, this is a, this is a Barnsley fighting guitar. It's made of quarter inch plate steel, and it's, it's what they play in Barnsley. If you don't listen, they smash your brains in with it. <laughs> and this is a song that I learned from a place near Barnsley called Wathon Doon. Now, you won't know Wathon Doon here because not many people go there, you know, because cooks don't run many tours there anymore. They used to do. 
<laughs> but uh, what's on doing? Smashing people, but it's a bit hard to describe the place itself, really, because what I'm doing, well, Hitler refused to bomb it. <laughs> he said nobody had no he'd been. <laughs> you know? I mean, really, honestly, I mean, you know how towns are twinned with other towns abroad who, who make cheese and they come and dance stupid dances around your town square in the rain in November, you know? Dressed in big blouses and coloured skirts. You know how you twin with the other towns on the continent that used to bomb years ago. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, Wathondern is actually twinned with Krakatoa. <laughs> and I was at this club. I was at this club on, uh, at Wathondern. It was the Maggot Fanciers and Embalmers Association annual, <laughs> annual dinner or something. No. It was a folk club, actually, I'm pulling your leg, and I was there, and this fellow got on with one of these fighting guitars, like a silver guitar like this, you know, and he's amazing, because you've got to think this is about ten years ago, you've got to remember, this is ten years ago, and this fellow's got long hair down here, like Colonel Custer, he's got one of them sort of straw yellow beards, you know, and he's a really handsome looking guy, all in denims, all embroidered at the back, and cowboy boots on, you know, and he looked really smooth, so he got this hat on, he came, cowboy hat on, and he got his guitar out, and he sat on the stage, and he did what all folk singers used to do in them days, and he got his cigarette, and he took it out, and he stuck it on the wire at the end here, on the neck, and his cigarette sticking up, smoking away, still lit light, and the guitar's going... <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> and he, he leaned into the microphone, and he's sort, of, he sort of really smooth, and I was just aghast looking at him, I thought, I want to be like him when I grow up, you know, because he was really so smooth and handsome, and he sort of let the microphone went... <laughs> I'm going to lay some blues on you, me now, man, you know. <laughs> I'm really going to lay the whole down, low down, row down, row down blues, man. I'm going to lay the blues down this day, lay. Do you dig? Do you dig? I dig you digging me, okay, man? Yeah. I'm going to lay that blues down this day, laid, okay? I'm going to lay the blues on you now about me and this chick. Like, I wrote these blues because I was really late, you know, me and this chick had got this good scene going, man. Like, I dug the chick, the chick dug me, and I dug the chick digging me off, you know, and the chick was really... <laughs> Digging, and I was digging the chick, you know. <laughs> Groovy scene, man, me digging the chick and the chick digging me, you dig? I thought, I do not believe this. This is what I'm doing on a Saturday night. There's a bloke talking about having unnatural relationships with ends. <laughs> what is it all about? He said, me and the chick got this real groovy scene going, like, you know, man. And then it got a bit heavy, like, you know, the scene got some really heavy vibes going, man, you know, because, like, you know, there was no bread, man, you know. You know, and the chick split. I thought, well, it would do. What's he going to eat? There's no bread. <laughs> you know? He said, when the chick split, man, you know, I got really down. You dig? I got really down, man. You know, I got the low-down blues. And I went downtown and met some of the cats. You know, man? I thought, oh, no, he's off the feathers into the fur now. <laughs> what a... What a fruit he is. What a banana this one is. He said, like, man, I was sitting there with the cats one day, like, man, you know, and we were smoking grass, you know? I thought, he is definitely an editor. <laughs> Definitely an edda, this bloke, like part driver, only one and fourpence for ten. <laughs> and he's smoking grass. I thought, what a nut pot this is. He said, we were smoking this grass, ma'am, and the pigs came in. I thought, oh, not pigs as well. <laughs> he was amazing. He said, so like, I'm going to lay down on you now, man. Real low down blues. <laughs> Woke up this morning. Got me them low down blues. <laughs> While I woke up this morning, yeah. Got me them low down blues. Cause I got dressed and halfway down the street before I realized the cat had done it in my shoes. <laughs> you went on. This, this song, this song went on and on for hours and hours and hours, all about toting bales of cotton on the levee and all that. It was, and he, at the end of it, he came off and they were stunned, you know. And I went to the bar, I thought I've got to buy him a drink, you know. I went to the, and I said, uh, that was smashing. He said, ah, I said it was right, Graham, I right enjoyed that, the nuts. <laughs> I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from Wath. I said, well, well, I thought you were from Texas or Memphis or. Someone like that, he said, no, he said, it's blues, I know. When I'm singing blues, I just get ticked over by it, then us. I said, I know what you are, actually. He said, what? I said, a pillock. 
He said, right done, man. So, what I want to do for you now is do the blues. The way I think they should be did, or dud, if, if you're in Wath on Dern. So it's Wath on Dern Blues. This morning didn't feel right grand the nose. <laughs> City by Eck. Woke up this morning didn't feel right greatly the nose. Got so drunk last night fell in love with a big garden gnome. <laughs> well I put me arms around him, laid him on the grass. I put me arms around him, laid him on the grass. But I got right worried when he started kissing me back. <laughs> you were a big lad, don't know. See, the I met a lass in Barnsley, so I thought I'd take a chance. I met a lass in Barnsley, so I thought I'd take a chance. But brooting me socks and self raising flower down me pants. <laughs> She said, lad, take off thy underpants, I tell thee this is it. Lad, take off thy underpants, I tell thee this is it. I said, I'll take them off and you're welcome, but I doubt if they'll blooming well fit. <laughs> you were big, than us. She said, let's get some baby oil and take it up to bed with us. Let's get some baby oil and take it up to bed with us. Well, I drank that baby oil and it just made me throw up oil. <laughs> no way on it, you were flat, oh, terrible. She said, I want to feel the earth move when the mechs love to me. I want to feel the earth move when the mechs love to me. I said, at this time of night, where am I going to find a JCB? <laughs> yeah, man. Dead honest. It's only when they grow up they learn to lie like us, you know, and, and tell fibs and do rotten things to each other. I mean, little kids are usually dead truthful. They say things like, hey, aren't you fat? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't mean anything about it. You don't bother about your fat or thing. You're just pointing out a fact. In fact, haven't you got a big nose, you? <laughs> I was like that when I was a kid, you know. We had a rent man. He's dead now, God bless him. We had this rent man, you know, he used to come around. And he used to have one of them books, you know, a big book. And he used to have a pencil that he used to lick to get it going. One of them laundry marker pencils, you know. And he had a purple tongue, you know. <laughs> locks on his bike clips, all the bit, you know. The trouble was he had this huge nose, an enormous nose. It, like, like a blind cobbler's thumb it was. It was huge, oh. <laughs> and, and I come in from school, I said, I'd never seen this bloke before. He'd come early, like, and I walked straight in. And my mum's there, in the, you know, getting in the, the tea caddy and getting the money out of the tea caddy to pay him, like, you know. I went to her and said, Hey, mum! Look at that bloke! She said, Chut! Chut! <laughs> she said, Go next, we live next to a corner shop, you see, when I was a kid. She said, Go next door to Peggy's, go and get a packet of tea. I said, Oh, mum, we got plenty of tea. Go and get a packet of tea. <laughs> so I went, a packet of tea, came back and I said, There's that tea, mum, there's the tea. Hey, <laughs> mum, <laughs> he's, he's got a big. She said, Out! Go and get me some sugar. I said, we've got loads of sugar, man. I mean, go and get me some sugar. Boom, quick. Came back and say, the sugar, man. Hey, man, look at that fish. She said, shut up, sit there, and do not say a word. Shut up. So I'm sat there, she said, I'm very sorry about that. She said, he's really very cheeky and naughty. I don't know what's come over him. How many sugars do you take in your nose? <laughs> so, what? I met this kid at the school. Michael Coffey is called Amazing Kid. What a villain he was. Steal your eye and come back for the socket. No problem. <laughs> really? And I'm snuggling away there. And he sat, 
He's like a mafia type kid, you know, he's sort of giving it. He says, uh, you're new here, aren't you, kid? I said, yeah, I'm a He says, nah, you'll be right in here. He says, you'll be right in here. He says, no problem at all. You know what I mean, pal? You know what I mean? Eh? Got it sorted in here, no messing. You know what I mean, kid? No sweat. Got it sorted. We have. See me, I'm the milk monitor. See me, mate, over there, straws monitor. We had a mate there, ink monitor, pencil monitor, crayon monitor, goldfish monitor, right? Oop monitor, bean bag monitor, sleepy time blanket and cushion monitor over there, right? <laughs> All my mates between us, we got it sewn up, this place. If we say no, it don't happen in here. Right? <laughs> See that kid over there, that kid over there, right? That kid over there, he can ride his bike with his feet on the handlebars and his hands on his head. I said, which one? He said, him with the broken nose and the <laughs> scars, he said, over there. So you see that girl over there with the red hair? That girl over there with the red hair? She'll show you her knickers for the jelly baby. <laughs> said, I haven't got no jelly babies. He said, good, save your eyesight. <laughs> he said, uh, tell you what, kid. He says, do you know how to blow a frog up with a straw? <laughs> I said, no. I said, that, that's cruel, isn't it? He said, no. He said, they love it. They like it. <laughs> They have a big grin on the face, they're like... <laughs> he said, hey, he said, has your, has your dad got a job or what? Well, I ain't got a dad, see? Like I said, I ain't got a dad, me. He says, oh, my dad, he's got a great job. He's an average rider. I said, he's a what? He said, he's an average rider. I said, what does that mean? He said, I, I don't know, really, but I heard him telling his mate he has a ride on an average three times a week. <laughs> be a good job if he only works three times a week, I thought. <laughs> but this kid, Michael Coffey, was with me. There was a lot of kids in that school that were amazing. Michael Coffey, Terry Tarpey. A guy called Clement Mulqueen was sat on the other side of me. I went home, my mum said, who are you sat next to? I said, Cannibal Mulqueen. <laughs> she thought I was, what? What sort of school is this, you know? But amazing. Because this Michael Coffey was with me. On the day, the most traumatic thing happened to me in my five and a half year life, like when... It was when I saw the school nativity play. It made me want to be a learned thespian and strut and fret me hour upon this stage here. The school nativity play that first year, we were not allowed to act in as five-year-olds. We are not allowed into it because the previous year, they'd used five-year-olds, right? And St. Joseph had whittled on the stage. Right? <laughs> and the donkey had slipped in it, right? <laughs> and the Christmas tree had gone over, right? And a bulb had gone in the goldfish bowl and boiled the goldfish. <laughs> and one of the wires had hit the hamster's cage and the hamster's in his little turntable doing about 18 pounds of revs with his ears stuck up like this. And another wire had gone on those stick insects and they'd all gone up in flames. It was a mayhem massacre. And the, you know, the RSPCA were running in with tiny little stretchers about this big and dragging them all out, <coughs> laying them down the street. It was massacre, terrible. So we were regarded, the five-year-olds were regarded as being incontinent actors. We were not allowed it into the play. Right? <laughs> so, all the, all the five-year-olds were sat on benches at the front, right? And there's all the teachers and the older kids, like mums and dads and grands, all behind them. And we all sat there on these benches, like typical five-year-old stands, thumb in, hand over the nose, rubbing our bellies, you know. <laughs> and in came the Virgin Mary, right? Now the Virgin Mary is a six-year-old girl, right? and she's dressed in the blue tablecloth, right, with the white belt round here, and she's got the blue tablecloth over here, and she's got the bald pot doll out of the Wendy house, right? <laughs> with just the bits of glue stuck on its head and fluff, like, you know. And it's wrapped up in a tea towel, so it's got Manchester Corporation Education Department. <laughs> <laughs> she comes in with it in her arms, and she's singing. We will walk you walk you walk you fever walk you walk you walk you and immediately all the mums and dads and uncles and aunts at the back of the classroom all start crying <laughs> oh aren't they bunny oh wouldn't you love oh wouldn't you love <laughs> hey, hey don't you wish they could stay like that oh aren't they? Hey, how could anybody hurt them oh wouldn't you lovely oh either little love and i'm sitting there thinking 
that's that girl I give all them jelly babies to last week, that is. <laughs> and following her, following her, comes St. Joseph. Now, St. Joseph, they've picked him because he's the biggest lad in the six year, you know, old six year olds, and he looks married. I don't know how they work this out, but he looks married. <laughs> And so they've got him dressed up in a brown tablecloth with old cut in it, like in a sort of tea towel with string round it, right? Brown tablecloth, tied up here, and the student teachers got him ready. But the tablecloth was too long, so she's hemmed it. But she's hemmed it with him in it. So she's hemmed his legs into the tablecloth. Right? <laughs> and his right leg is completely sewn into this brown tablecloth, which means that he's all pulled up like this. He's all, all misshapen like this. Like, and added to this, They've made him a beard from brown crepe paper cut into strips which they've stuck on his head with cow gum, right? <laughs> but as the cow gum's dried, it's pulled his whole head out of shape, so he's got one eye down here, the other one up there. <laughs> and he can't move, he can't sing properly, so he's just muttering and groaning, right? So he's following the Virgin Mary, so he's going, <laughs> Seventeen kids on the front row let out gibbering with fear, just... <laughs> the parents at the back of the class are going, oh my God. <laughs> that poor child, oh dear me, look at that. Oh, the poor little child, oh dear. So Quasimodo and the Virgin Mary... <laughs> get on stage, right? And they've got the bald pot doll in their hand, they have a couple of rows with about two dozen innkeepers who are all the same kid with different moustaches and hats on. No room, no room, no room. Eventually, they get in this stable, dump the baby in the crib and kneel down and have an door. They're adoring there, right? Having a good adore, right? Meantime, right? Meantime, they're getting ready the ox and the donkey at the back of the class. Now, the ox and the donkey, uh, two kids for each animal, inside a blanket with a cardboard box on the head. One with ears on it and one with horns on it, right? <laughs> The only problem is they've forgotten to cut holes in the cardboard box. <laughs> so when they start playing away in a manger, the two animals turn the wrong direction and go out into the street. <laughs> a bus swerves to avoid them, it's a milk crate that goes straight through Woolly's shop window, right? <laughs> Old ladies are blessing themselves all over the street, people are fainting, they have to be dragged back in, shoved back in the classroom, and Miss Wurzwick's poking them down the corridor, like, and poking them down the alleyway between the rows of seats, with a ruler. She's going, come on, get on stage. And from halfway down the donkey comes a little voice with a phrase that will remain seared on my memory forever. Halfway down the donkey, this little voice says, oh, Your bum doesn't half smell in here. Miss <laughs> 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 Worsby's got the rule, she's going, Shut up, shut up, <laughs> be quiet. But I'm sure Miss Worsby's his bum really smells in here. Shut up. <laughs> they wobble them on stage, and they get them on stage, and the three shepherds are getting ready at the back of the class. Now these shepherds, these shepherds are the headbangers of the six-year-olds, right? <laughs> they are not a full shilling, right? <laughs> They've not got ninepence between them, right? These are the kids who, when the teacher explains something, no matter how long she takes explaining it, or what it's about, if it's how to keep goldfish, or if it's how to cut things up with a pair of scissors, or how to get gum paper squares and fold them up and make Christmas cards out of them that always look monkey and horrible, and you lose them on the way home because you're ashamed to give it to your mum, you know. No matter how long she takes explaining things, always at the end of the explanation, they put their hand up and say, Do you have to use a pencil, Miss Rosewick? It's a contract to try and prove they've been listening. It doesn't matter what it is about, you know. Good morning, children. Just use a pencil, Miss Rosby. <laughs> she's got these three at the back of the class. And she's saying, right, now, they're all in the brown bits, right? You know, shepherd's uniforms, bent sticks at the end, you know, bits of wire. She said, now, children, here's the fluffy lamb. Now, all you've got to do is walk down the classroom, put the fluffy lamb in the manger, and kneel down on the door. What have you got to do? Yeah, we've got to put the fluffy classroom in the door. <laughs> Do we have to use a pencil, Miss Rosie? <laughs> so, you've got to walk down there and not look at anybody or stare at anybody or pull faces at anybody or laugh at anybody or talk to anybody. What have you got to do? Hey, we're not going to talk at anybody or pull the faces. Do we have to use a pencil, Miss Rosie? <laughs> Go on. So she pushes them down and on come the shepherd. Like, well, shepherd, what the fuck? Pain it, or she don't grin. Hey, drop, drop, kid them. Oh, ma'am. Oh, ma'am. <laughs> 
Hey, my mum over there, get scum, get there's my mum. There's your Uncle Fred. Oh, they can't help it. They're on stage, kneeling down, <laughs> waving at everybody. Oh, there's your Uncle Fred, get there, oh, it's great. And look at the laughing at that kid on the front row with a big nose. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Willowick goes behind the curtains made out of the old rags like she gets this ruler and she's jabbing it in the back. Stop it, stop it. He thinks it's the kid next to him. Hey, pack in! Ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom. <laughs> So the three shepherds are rolling over and knocking seven lumps of good for the roses out of each other. <laughs> right? The Virgin Mary's winking at all the lads on the front row, right? Quasimodo's... <laughs> the donkey, oh, I'm going to be sick in a minute in here. I'm going to be sick. It's terrible. It's terrible. Right? <laughs> in the meantime, in the meantime, the angels are getting ready in the stock cupboard, right? Now, one of these angels is my mate, Worfy, right? Now, my mate, Worfy, he should have been a shepherd. He should have been, he was cut out to be a shepherd, definitely, right? But a bit of miscasting, he somehow ended up as an angel, right? I think they, they'd had enough shepherds and they were short of an angel or something, so they whip him in, right? So he's there in the stock cupboard. In comes Miss Worswick, our teacher, with the little white smocks that they're going to wear, right? The cardboard wings on the braces and the brass wire made like a halo stuck on the cardboard wings at the back, right? She comes in and says, right, boys, now, here are your wings and your halos and your little smocks. Now, take your shoes and socks off and take all your pants off and put them on. What if he said, well, you have to take uh, all our pants off for, please, Miss Worswick. She said, because, Worf, angels do not wear grey flannel trousers hanging down underneath the smocks. Why not, please, Miss Worswick? <laughs> because they don't come to this school, Worf. That's why. <laughs> OK. Right, get your shoes and socks off and all your pants, right? Understand? Yes, Miss Worswick. Do we have to use a pencil, please, Miss Worswick? <laughs> so, get it, brother. So they get changed, right? Now, Wolfie's heard her say, take all your pants off. He thinks it doesn't mean take all take your pants off. He thinks it means take all your pants off. Have you seen what I mean? So he takes his pants off and his trolleys as well. All of them, right? <laughs> now, these angels' smocks are very short, right? <laughs> they just about cover the Barclay card, you know? <laughs> right? So they get the braces on and the wings and the halo and on come on come the three angels right out they come two of them that is because the third one closes the stock cupboard door behind him traps his wings in it he's walking nothing's happening <laughs> something's got me miss worswick <laughs> miss worswick goes releases him he joins the other and they come on stage now there's no room behind the manger because it's full of fighting shepherds, Cosimodo, Virgin Mary, and I think I'm really going to be sick any minute now. So the only place, the only place the angels can stand is the other side of the manger, right? In front of it, with the backs to the audience, and they bow down to adore the baby in the manger. At this point, Michael Coffey wakes up and goes, You can see the angel's ass, Miss Worswick! <laughs> and this, this time the donkeys whittle on stage <laughs> and St. Joseph slips in it. And as he slips, his leg comes out of the hem, his beard falls off and he stands up straight and all the adults go, Oh, it's a miracle. <laughs> St. Anne's Crumsel, 1949. And I know, I was that donkey. <laughs> hey. But, but when you're a kid, anyway. What was I talking about? Oh, right, kids. When, when you're a kid, there's always one person that you can rely on. It doesn't matter what happens. You can always go to them. And they'll always look after you. And they spoil you and ruin you. Because they're your granddad and your grandma, right? And they know they can ruin you and spoil you because you've got to go home at tea time. 
spend all day ruining you, you go home and wreck the house and your mum and dad thump you, you know. You've been at your granddad's again, he's ruining you, boom, you know. Because they say to you, your granddad says, oh, your grandma, come here, love, come here. Who did? Who, your dad what? Oh, come here. I used to kick his backside for doing that when he was a lad. Come here. Grandma. And they love you and they spoil you. And this song's about my granddad and about another man that I used to love when I was a kid, my uncle Bobby, who's in, in Canada at the moment, but he used to look after me when I was a kid. It's, the song's called Me and Granddad and Mates. It's not a, a very intellectual song. If anybody at home is looking for great intellectual content in this program, turn over masterminds on the other side. But, um, but this is just, a, if you like, a, a bit of a sentimental song in a way, but it's a true sentiment. Called Me and Grandad and Mates. Grandad takes me fishing on a Saturday, me and Grandad's mates. Grandad brings me maggots, pink and yellow ones, and me hooks and weights. We sit all day, come rain or shine, on the banks of the old canal. Sometimes we sing out, other days we chat awake as me and Grandad's pals. Grandad takes me walking with his little dog, he calls her Jip. We go to the pub and Grandad has a pint of grog, gives me a sip. He says he drinks beer cause his legs are stiff and he toils them and makes them supple. Sometimes I think it works too well Cause it doesn't half make him wobble <laughs> Grandad, he comes round and sits with me When mum and me dad go out We play snakes and ladders and monopoly Grandad has a bottle of stout He lets me stay up till half past ten And if me mum asks him what time He made me go upstairs to bed Grandad says half past nine Grandad tells me all about the things he did when he was a lad Grandad tells me all about the war and when times were bad Sometimes he talks about me gran and then he looks far away He says she's been gone a long, long time but he'll see her again someday Grandad shows me tricks with pennies, Grandad flies me kites Granda brings me fish and chips home from the pub at night And if ever I grow up and I get old and my kids they have kids Then I'll take them fishing and do all the other things that me granddad did Cos Grandad takes me fishing on a Saturday, me and me granddad's mates Grandad brings me maggots, pink and yellow ones and me hooks and weights we sit all day, come rain and shine, on the banks of the old canal. Sometimes we say out, other days we chat away, cause me and me granddad's pals. There's some good laughers up there, aren't they? <laughs> Does that fellow have to be with you with the overcoat on back to front? <laughs> <laughs> now, well, this is a song... <laughs> a song about love, and um, in case, a lot of people, I suppose, a lot of people at home... If you leave it alone, it'll heal up, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, like, when I was at school, we were there one day, I mean, this kid called Fingy, because all kids are called Fingy at school. Hey, Fingy, hey, Fingy, hey, Fingy. <laughs> Fingy. So they're in school one day, and me and this kid called Fingy, have got this other kid called Fingy, and we're making him eat the sand tray, you know. <laughs> he doesn't want to, because he already had about three pound of plasticine and 28... <laughs> 28 bean bags, but we got a leg and an arm apiece, and we're shoveling him head first through all this sand. <laughs> and this kid called Fingy says to me, he said, uh, he said, hey, Fingy. He said, uh, how old are you? I said, uh, I don't know me. He said, you don't know how old you are. 
I said, no. How old are you? He said, me. He said, I'm five, me. I don't know how old I am. I said, he said, well, look, he said, you must know. I said, I don't. He said, well, look, he said, are you bothered about smoking and booze and women and things? I said, no. He said, you're about four and a half then, you are. He says, <laughs> A few years after that, seriously, a few years after that, I fell in love deeply, deeply. I mean, I mean, you, you, how can you describe that ache, that ache that you have within yourself, that, that, oh, that you're waiting, you're waiting around the car, just hoping to catch a glimpse of her, and you follow her to school, and oh, and it's awful, and you know, you go through it, and you, I was just madly in love with this girl called Pamela Dolman, you know, and, and her dad had the toffee shop, you know, it was, you know, it was love at first bite, you know. And I, <laughs> I did, no, I, I did, I, I loved it. We were in love with each other for ages and ages, you know, about three weeks. And I fell out with her because she wouldn't eat worms, you know. <laughs> and for years after that, I just thought the girls were stupid lads who couldn't climb trees without showing their knickers. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, those days of love, wasn't it simple when, you know, you'd, you'd give each other things, you know, like when, when love was just a handful of sticky conkers, you know. <laughs> Hasn't changed all that much. Anyway, this is... <laughs> I just thought of that. <laughs> but this is... The song about those days. If I embarrass anybody, tell your friends they'll come next time. <laughs> but this is a song that... It's, it's about love and it's about, it's about the first time I fell in love. It's called Pamela Dolman's Song. The first time I ever fancied you, it was at our street bonfire party. I let penny bangers off in me hand for you. I thought I was a real smarty Then me mum came up behind me And she gave me such a crack And as she dragged me off home bleeding up the back alley I heard you laugh behind me back Oh you did, yes you did, you know you did <laughs> I fell a pinch that tune off me, you know <laughs> You know, you know I'd do anything for you Cause I really love your tatty hair I'd stay in a cage with them manji lions in Bellevue Zoo I'd even fight the bald polar bear And I'd stay all night in the haunted house At the top of Factory Brew Single-handed and without me catapult I'd fight the entire gas street gang All them things I'd do for you Yes I would, cause I'm a pillock and it shows <laughs> well, I'll take you to the Bugut on a Friday night And I'll buy you a ninepenny seat And when the lady comes round with the ice cream tray I'll pinch you a lolly for a treat And we can sit there watching Flash Gordon and Eckle and Jekyll and the Three Stooges and Oplong Cassidy and I'll hold your hand in the dark And afterwards coming home you can hold mine Cos I'm frightened of them big statues in the park Yes I am, cos I'm a coward, so's me dad <laughs> He'd done the stairs in the war Your mum hasn't told him it's over yet <laughs> Well, I saw your knickers at the coronation party Cause your frock twilled up when you danced around When you give me a kiss in my Uncle Larry's air raid shelter I felt six feet off the ground And I give you me coronation mug Me spud gun and me dead sparrow's wing and if only you'd tell me you'd love me, I'd run all the way to Woolies And I'd pinch a ring, yes I would, cos I'm a thief, it runs in the family 
My granddad's doing time for sucking the tanners out of parking meters. <laughs> oh. I know I'm only nine years old. And I know I don't get much to spend. But we could live in my grand's coal shed. I'd clean it out with Albert Dalton, my best friend. And you wouldn't have to worry about money at all. Cause I could sell me granddad's whippet dog. If only you would give me your heart. I would give you me frog. 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 Arnold, my frog. Hey, man, you know, mesdames and messieurs, <laughs> le moment est arrivé que vous attendez avec le breath bêtise, n'est-ce pas? Parce que je vais donner vous. Boku de Lugol Ake avec le GBH of the Euro avec le rock and roll music solo electric guitar aujourd'hui this night, n'est-ce pas? <laughs> Gracias, mucho, <laughs> etc., etc. <laughs> So I said to this bloke, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> I love it. I love it, that rock and roll, I love it. It's, it's like mumps, it's in my blood, you know. <laughs> oh. I do, I love it. It's like a religion to me, you know. Three chord trick, I used to be there in the old days, playing Burning Manning's Club. 18 months I did it at Burning Manning's Club. You don't get that for murder nowadays, do you? <laughs> Wonderful man, Bernard, you know. He doesn't like me, Bernard, you know. Don't like me. I don't know why. He doesn't like me, though. He doesn't like me. And yet he's such a sensitive and wonderful person himself, you know. <laughs> but as sensitive as a dinosaur with piles. <laughs> great block. Why is a great block? How can somebody walk around with a brain that's been surgically dead for 24 years? <laughs> oh, he's amazing. Well, it's a wonderful thing to think that when the Pope comes to Manchester, he's coming to Manchester, the Pope, and he's going to hold a mass for 20,000 people in Bernard Manning's mouth. <laughs> Great. But uh, rock and roll is a religion to me, you know, I mean, the old days playing away there, three chord tricks, you know, like... Uh... Got no bags or bags to slow me down. You move a little finger and make a seventh chord. Travelling so fast. My feet ain't touching the ground Cos I'm dying for it <laughs> You know, I'm... all that sort of thing I used to do I love it, you know, love it. it's just like religion to me Cos, I'm, you know, I'm not a very religious person now But I was brought up a very strict religious person I was brought up as a Roman Catholic, you know, left footer, you know And, uh, no, I was, you know I was the only one in our street as it happened, you know And you'd be going to Mass on Sunday morning And all your mates would be shouting Oh, Roman catapult! <laughs> You shout, ah, oh, pretty dogs eat boogies, yeah, you know. But that was as far as it went, because there was never any real animosity, you know, religion was important, but you never fell out about it, you know, and it was sort of 
Because you're more important things to do when you were a kid. You were playing, you know, games like, you know, you show me and I'll show you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Saw some terrible things playing that game. Sure, the other kids wanted to use them as wickets. I said, it's not fair. <laughs> You know, and uh, doctors and nurses. Do you ever play doctors and nurses? Yeah. I got in trouble playing that, I did. <laughs> Saw the kid's head off. <laughs> I said, I'll put it back, I was only playing. <laughs> yeah, but we got taught religion at school as well, you see, being left footers. We had, you know, a lot of religious classes at school. And Miss Worswick used to teach us religion. And it was really confusing when I was a kid, because remember we were five year old and we were sat in there and Miss Worswick said, now children, Put everything in your desks and sit up straight and listen because this is very, very important what I'm going to tell you now. All you children have got something inside you that you can't see. It's the most important thing that you've got, but you can't see it or touch it or hear it or feel it. I thought, well, if it's bloody important, bugger it, I can't. <laughs> can't see it, touch it, feel it. She said, this thing, children, is the most important thing any of you could have. It is your soul. Michael Coffey next to me and whispered in my ear, our soul. <laughs> And I thought that was the answer to a question. I've got my hand up. Miss Worswick, I know Miss Worswick. Oh, Miss Worswick, ask me, Miss Worswick, ask me. She said, yes. I said, our souls, Miss Worswick. <laughs> Ruler, straight between the eyes. <laughs> she should have been a Matabili warrior, that woman. She was great with that ruler. <laughs> she said, I'll see you later. She said, no, children, your soul is inside you. And when you're born and you're baptized and you're a baby, your soul becomes pure snow white and it stays white until you commit horrible sins and when you commit a sin a black mark goes on your soul and it stays there and your soul if you commit more sins will get blacker and blacker and blacker and if you die with your soul black you'll go to hell and you'll burn forever and ever and ever and ever in fire and torment and pain and i'm going oh. <laughs> I only pinched a pencil from Wally's Miss Worsby. <laughs> she said, but, and I thought, oh, there's a cop out. Thank God. <laughs> she said, there is one person who will help you to not sin, who will help to stop you from sinning. This one person is the most important person in your life. This is your guardian angel. I said, please, Miss Worswick, I've never seen no angels cutting roses and digging flower beds up. She said, not a gardening angel, Harding. <laughs> a guardian angel. She said, and your guardian angel, children, he goes everywhere with you. He never leaves your side for one minute. Wherever you go, your guardian angel is there. From the moment you're born to the moment you die, your guardian angel stays with you everywhere. He is at your side. I'm looking up. <laughs> hey, coffee, you're something, my guardian angel. He said, you're sat on mine. I said, get up, let's have a look. I said, I can't see. It must be stuck to your bum. I can't see it. <laughs> Please, Miss Worswick, how big are these gardening angels? She said, guardian angels are big, taller than any men you know, and they've got beautiful golden blonde hair in locks that goes down to the waist, and they have a silvery, shiny robe that goes right down to the floor, and they have beautiful, big, white wings like swan's wings, and beautiful faces, and lovely, kind eyes, and they're invisible. <laughs> I said, uh, please, Miss Roswick, please, Miss Roswick, please, how do you know they've got beautiful barnets and silvery nighties on them, uh, big flappers, if they're invisible? She said, clever dick, eh? I said, I don't know, Miss Worswick, I've never asked it no questions. <laughs> what seven take away three? It doesn't know, Miss Worswick. <laughs> she said, I'll see you later. Your guardian angel. And she went on and on about these guardian angels. And I believed her. Because Miss Worswick was our teacher. And teachers were always right. And Miss Worswick had been right about the goldfish dying if we painted it black. That night on the bus, I paid for him. Two, please. <laughs> Me and him. Who? Me and him. Oh, right. <laughs> and I went in our house. Our house. Hello, ma'am. Hello, dad. Hello, Christina. Hello, Graham. Come on, Paul. Get you something to eat. Come on. <laughs> and Graham's going, holy mother of God, the child's possessed. She's got holy water thrown at him. <laughs> talking to somebody who wasn't there. I sat at the table. I said, sit here, Paul. I'll get you something to eat. 
Must be starving, didn't know you were there for five years. Nobody told me. <laughs> we got in bed that night, I'm making myself small so there's room for him. Come on, get him. Get, him. get your feet on the hot water bottle, you must be freezing cold wobbling around them clouds with no shoes and socks on. Get him. Yeah. Well, I believed he was everywhere with me. Walk around, used to take him out to the pictures. What do you think of that one then? Rubbish, wasn't it, you know? But the worst thing was, when you're playing football on the crop with the lads, like, we're you all know, playing football, like, you know, and you know what you're like when you're kids, you're eating loads of pop and you're out playing football. And I was bursting for a Jimmy Riddle, you know. But the trouble is, I didn't know where he was. <laughs> I'm saying, hey, watch out now, I'm having a pee over here. Keep out of my way. Because <laughs> you don't want to pee on your guardian angel, do you? You know what I mean? Because <laughs> while he's away, ringing his smock out, the devil can get you. <laughs> Oh, but she got me in loads of trouble doing Miss Worswick at school. She, one March, she said, this is the month of March, children. Now, what is March important for, for Catholics? What is it important for, for Catholics? Does anybody know? Me. Tadpoles, Miss Worswick. <laughs> Ruler. <laughs> no harding. March is important because it's the month of a very famous and very important saint. Now, which saint is this the month of? Now, Bernadette never skated in you because she got a missile open under her desk and she was reading off it. St. Joseph, Miss Wiswick. Very good, Bernadette. St. Joseph. Now, what is St. Joseph the patron saint of? Tadpoles, Miss Wiswick. <laughs> Ruler. <laughs> well, the worst thing was the first time I did commit a big sin. You've never seen anybody move so fast to church in your life. Sanctuary! It was the first time I ever had carnival knowledge of a lady. <laughs> it was nothing really serious by today's standards. It was nothing. You know, I was only 12 years old, for God's sake. You know, nothing really serious. It was just a bit of touchy-touchy, you know. <laughs> bit of lucky-lucky as well, but no, no you know. <laughs> no putty in his or anything like that. You know, just... <laughs> and to be fair, I mean, to be fair, I was led astray, quite honestly. I mean, she was an older woman than me. She was mature. She was 13 and a half. She was a woman of the world. And the lads knew her. She had her own bike. She was mobile. She used to... You know. The lads knew her. She was called Fields on Wheels. Everybody knew her. I, I didn't know. But, but... But I knew it was a sin because I'd enjoyed it. I knew it must be a sin. I've enjoyed it. And I'd started turning to stone like me dad told me I would, you know. And, and I thought, Brian, I'd better get to church quick before this spreads, you know, because I thought it's, it's going to And I started really... It was weird enough about halfway there, but I thought, take no chances. And I got there. And I pushed all these old ladies out of the way and they're hitting me with rosary bees and stop it, you know. And I jumped the queue like they're all muttering, he's banging on the door and things. And I flung myself down in the confessional light. And they can't see you, there's a screen there, like, and he couldn't see me. Like, I said, bless me, Father, try for sin, please. I said, this is uh, 12 hours since my last confession. Uh, <laughs> please, please, Father, I've committed uh, a, a sin of impurity. He said, uh, was it by yourself or with somebody else? <laughs> I didn't know you could do it by yourself. <laughs> You would have seen me four park driving a packet of Smarties if I'd known that. <laughs> I said, it was with somebody else you'd turn it. What are you talking about? <laughs> he said, was it a boy or a girl? I didn't know that either. That was something else. <laughs> I thought, I'd never look at Wolfie in the same light again. I, <laughs> I said, no, it was a girl. He said, now he said, there's too much of this thing going on in this parish with the young people. He said, who was it? I said, I, I can't say that. I can't tell you that. He said, well, he said, you don't have to say who it is. He said, I'll mention some names, and when I get to the name, you cough. I said, it wasn't you cough. No, it wasn't you cough. <laughs> I've never heard of anybody call you. He said, not you cough, you cough. You cough, you cough. <laughs> he said, is there a price for the answer to this? <laughs> he said, I'll mention a name, and when I get to the name, you make a coughing noise. I said, okay. He said, was it Teresa Feeney? I said, no. Was it Maureen O'Halloran? I said, no. He said, was it Patricia Driscoll? I said, no. Was it Patricia Henderson? No. Was it Cynthia Teal? I said, no. He said, was it uh, Sheila Bevan? I said, no. He said, was it none of these? I said, no, Father. He said, well, get out and don't waste my time now. Go on, get out and come back when you're ready to tell me properly. Go on. He threw me out. I got out and my mate said, how'd you go on? 
I said, well, I've got some good tips for next week. I said this. <laughs> But because of the changes and, and because now they've got like folk masses and rock and roll masses and things and, and you've got like Jesus Christ Superstar and Rock Nativity, I decided to write my own rock and roll religious song and I want you to watch, you people at home especially, all you people on the front row, watch this right leg. This may look a mundane and ordinary right leg to most of you out there. You may say, what is he talking about, this headbanger? I can see nothing wrong with that leg apart from the fact that it's got a patriotic bottom end. You see? But this right leg is more than an ordinary right leg. It is a drum playing right leg. This right leg is the Gene Krupa, the Sandy Nelson, the Louis Belson of legs. This leg on its own plays the drums. I'm going to say no more than that. You're going to be mystified and amazed. This leg will play subtle movements, but it will play the drums. Right. Deep in the convent something stirred Was not a mouse, not a little tiny bird Mother Superior said, bless my soul Them noises in the cloisters sound like rock and roll She's a rock and roll nun Amazing everyone A boogie woogie sister where the fingers blistered While the other Carmelites are praising the Lord Sister will demean us, wrapping out the cords At Mass and Vespers every day She bears herself in a very nunly way But instead of sleeping like a good nun should She's wrapping up the boogie on Johnny B. Good She's a rock and roll nun Amazing everyone! A boogie woogie sister with her fingers blistered While the other Carmelites are praising the Lord Sister will demean us wrapping up the cords With the amp turned up to 20 megawatts Sister Wilhelmina rocks around the clock So it's one for the money, two for the show The sisters are all bopping saying Go nun go, she's a rock and roll nun Amazing everyone! A boogie woogie sister with her fingers blistered While the other Carmelites are praising the Lord Sister Wilhelmina's wiping out the cord With a Hank Marvin glasses and an Eric Clapton beard Sister Wilhelmina looks a little weird All the other nuns are having high frolics Sister Wilhelmina's dropping loads of notes She's a rock and roll nun Amazing everyone! A boogie woogie sister with her fingers blistered While the other Carmelites are praising the Lord Sister Wilhelmina's wiping out the cords Sister Wilhelmina's not playing on her own Mother Superior's learning saxophone And from St. Peter's the word has come The Pope's up all night practicing the drum She's a rock and roll nun Amazing everyone! A boogie woogie sister with her fingers blistered While the other Carmelites are praising the Lord Sister Wilhelmina's wiping out the cord Thank you. Good night.